Okay. Um, this is going to be a crash course. A crash, crash course. They gave me three hours to teach you about statutory interpretation. Um, we're going to cover a lot of material. Um, questions come after. I think I can finish on time. Maybe with the break, seeing where we're going. We have a lot to cover. Uh, by way of background, I clerked for three years. <clears throat> I clerked for two years in the district court in the Western District of Pennsylvania. And I clerked for one year on the Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit uh, for Judge Boggs. I've been a law professor now for eight years. I think I've met most of you at FEDSOC chapters throughout the country. I know a lot of friendly faces in this room. Um, you don't have to write down everything. I will make these slides available through John. You're welcome, I'm a professor, I know. Uh, I'll send these to John later and they can circulate them. So please uh, don't write everything down. In fact, I don't want you to copy with some slides. I want you to listen and absorb because there's a lot of material here. Um, the basis of my talk is pretty much the Bible uh, for this area. If you do not have a copy of this book, um, you should buy one. They're not expensive. They're on Kindle. You can buy it anywhere. And you will find yourself referring to it very, very often. Um, it's called Reading Law, the Interpretation of Legal Texts. It's written by Justice Scalia and Brian Garner. You might know Brian Garner. He's a leading uh, legal lexicographer on earth. He writes the Black's Law Dictionary. He writes every book. Um, and Scalia and Garner put their heads together, and they produce a work of art. Um, I can't recommend this book enough. It's cited all the time by the Supreme Court. It's cited all the time by the lower courts. If you have a statutory decision in your chambers, you'll look at this book. And my goal here is to explain to you the 70, 70 of statutory interpretation. There are 70 in there, right? Like 100, but there are 70 here, so we'll deal with a 70, okay? Again, this is not meant to be thorough. Their classes on legislation, they'll give you lots more background, but this is your crash course. Um, the basic principle of this book is what's called textualism. Um, textualism means, simply, words mean what they convey to a reasonable person at the time they were written. We understand that some terms might embrace later technological innovations. But textualism, in its purest form, begins and ends with what the text says and fairly implies. Its principal tenets have guided the interpretation of text for millennia. Textualism is not new. In fact, the deviation from textualism is what's new. Now, you might have heard this before, that we are all textualists now. Indeed, Justice Elena Kagan has said this on a few occasions. The reason why people are drawn to textualism, at least at the outset, is because it doesn't really serve any ideological end. Textualism relies on the most objective criterion available, the accepted meaning that words had when the law was enacted. Sometimes textualism leads to conservative outcomes, and sometimes textualism leads to liberal outcomes. But you ride the horse because it's the fairest one to ride. Now, I'm a textualist. Maybe you are. I don't know. Don't really care. But I like textualism. The opposite of textualism is what's called, I always necessarily, prepos damn it, I did it. Pur <laughs> pur purposivism. I want to say like purposivism. That sounds awful. Purposivism. Okay? The purposivist, and by the way, my Latin's terrible, just wait for it, uh, goes, ar the purposivist goes around or behind the words of the controlling text to achieve what he believes is the provision's purpose. And purpose is taken to mean the purpose of the author, which means that you bring in all sorts of non textual material, like legislative history. And these sources are used to figure out what they think is the fairest meaning of the text. Um, Judge Easterbrook describes purposivism in terms of a ladder. Every law 
has a number of possible purposes. Okay? Consider it like a ladder of abstraction. You might have one rung with purpose number one, a second rung with purpose number two, and a third rung with purpose number three. You can basically go up or down the ladder to find the purpose that you think is the best purpose. So let's say we have a law against pickpocketing, right? What's the most narrow purpose? Preventing theft. Another purpose, more general, protection of private property. Another one, preventing, I'm sorry, pre preserving private ownership. Another one, the incursion of productive activity. Finally, the furtherance of the common good. Depending what level of abstraction you choose, you can make a fairly simple statute become quite broad or quite narrow. And judges can read in exceptions to statutes that might not otherwise be there. Purposivists can fill in blanks in statutes by picking the appropriate rung on a ladder. Now, a common criticism you might hear about textualism is, well, the text is ambiguous or vague. And to be frank, people don't know the difference between the two concepts. Um, ambiguity and vagueness are not the same thing. They're not. People use them interchangeably. They have different meanings. A word is ambiguous when the question is which of two more meanings applies. A word is vague when its unquestionable meaning has uncertain applications to various factual considerations. So let me give you an example. Uh, in the 90s, the Supreme Court had a case that involved a statute. And the statute imposed a penalty for, quote, using a firearm in connection with a drug crime. Um, the majority, which was by Justice Scalia, thought that the phrase using a firearm was ambiguous, right? Now, does that mean using a firearm like shooting it? Does it mean maybe trading a gun for drugs, right? That is what you might call ambiguity. The dissenters thought it was a little vague. The dissenters thought it referred to the use of a firearm only for which firearms are normally employed, that is, shooting each other. So even in the same case, you have a majority and dissenting opinion that one finds it ambiguous, one finds it vague. But these are different concepts. All right. All right. So I want to begin our discussion with uh, a theme that some of you may have heard of before. No vehicles in the park. OK, good. I love this one. OK. This is actually a real sign at Golden Gate Park. I took a picture of it. So he says, no vehicles, right? Right over there. Um, and I actually risked my life to take this picture. Why? See that guy on a bike over there? About a second after I took that picture, he was about an inch away from me. So I had to quickly step aside. So you're, you're welcome. Um, but this classic riddle of no vehicles in the park is offered to give people a thought experiment. How do you interpret the most simple sign in the world, right? You go to any park, any, I'm sure if you go to the park right across the street, you'll see it says no vehicles in the park. So maybe you say, okay, well, let's open a dictionary. Believe it or not, in most dictionaries, one of the first definitions for vehicle has to do with liquid or a substance that connects with another substance, right? You mix in stuff, right? Well, I think we can rule out, based on the context of the sign, we're not trying to keep, you know, solutions and liquids out of the park. Okay, so that might be one way of resolving it. So maybe we go to the next entry of the dictionary. And a dictionary can mean, I'll read one of them, a means of conveyance, usually with wheels, for transporting people, goods, etc. Another dictionary says, any means of carriage or transport. Okay, I can go with that. Carriage or transport. That sounds decent. So then we ask ourselves, what about an airplane? An airplane has wheels, they land. It's a means of transport. Can you land an airplane in a park? What about a toy car? You used to transport a little Spider-Man, right? Is that a vehicle? Doesn't meet the criteria. Right? What about a baby carriage? Which used to transport a person. Do you ban baby carriages? Anything that's ever called a vehicle would fall with these definitions. But we're looking for a more common usage, 
right? Not every means of conveyance with wheels is commonly called a vehicle. Think of a rollerboard suitcase with wheels. Carry stuff around as wheels, is that a vehicle? Another dictionary gives a definition. A self-propelled conveyance that runs on tires, a motor vehicle. Usually students like this one, right? A self-propelled vehicle that, that runs on tires. Okay. What about a remote control car? Hmm. If we take it literally, that will exclude things that usually come into parks. I think the proper colloquial meaning for a vehicle, and this is my definition, and Scalia is also, so I know I'm probably right, is a, I got all this from Scalia and Garner. This is, this is, their book is good. Uh, but I think a good popular definition is a sizable wheeled conveyance, right? So we talk about a conveyance that moves stuff around, that has to have wheels, and also of a certain size, we exclude like the remote control cars. But maybe another way to answer this question is we ask purpose, right? Why was this sign put up, no vehicles in the park? Right? Why, what, what's the purpose behind the statute? So maybe one reason is to preserve the quiet and restful atmosphere of the park. We don't want noisy vehicles. But what about the Segway? Right? These things look ridiculous, right? But they're silent. They just, bzzz, right? You know, they, they sort of just buzz around. They make no noise, right? If the purpose of the sign is to keep out noise, then I don't see any reason to keep out a Segway scooter. So maybe you might ask, the purpose is to eliminate dangerous, fast-moving objects, right? That seems reasonable. What about a bicycle? Remember that guy coming down the hill in San Francisco almost killed me, right? Bicycles can move very fast. On a hill, they can move almost as fast as a car. So do we exclude bicycles? Everything someone flying with rollerblades, those go fast. And those are hard to stop if you're on a hill. People can kill themselves like that. So do you exclude rollerblades? So everyone's like, well, I don't know, Josh. Where do we where do you go from there? So the next one's gonna give you a loop. What about an ambulance? If there's a emergency in the park and an ambulance driver enters, is that person then arrested for trespass for entering the park in a vehicle? Right? So if you're purposivist, right? You would make an exception. You say, you would want to place peace and quiet above saving a human life, right? There's no definition in the dictionary that covers ambulances. So we just basically create a new ordinance, one that excludes vehicles like ambulances that are quiet and they can go pretty fast. Um, this may make sense, but that's not the ordinance the city enacted. In fact, I think it would be illegitimate to carve out an exception for um, uh, uh, ambulances, right? I mean, the prosecutor need not bring the charges, and the perhaps executive can grant clemency, or the statute can be repealed by the legislature and modified. Uh, but I think judges should be careful reading in exceptions to statutes, because when you start reading in exceptions for an easy case like this, it's like an intoxicating drug. You do it once, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, then eventually you keep doing it, and then you don't know, you don't know where you started from. So I, I like to start this discussion with the most simple, you know, no vehicles in the park for a couple words. And you can see how quickly that, that drug can get your first hit of dopamine, and then you're off to the races. All right. So over the next two hours and 45 minutes, I, I want to run through 70, 70, 70 principles of statutory interpretation. The first 37 of them uh, are applicable to all texts, uh, whether it's a contract or a will or a merger agreement. Uh, these are principles that I think you can extend to virtually any written document. Um, principles 38 through 80 uh, are special rules that apply to government documents, whether it's a statute or a code or regulation. There are different considerations when considering a governmental document that simply don't exist when private parties negotiate at arm length. Constitutional doubt, things of that nature, right? But we start with rules that should apply anywhere. Um, <clears throat> I've divided these up into was it, was it eight or nine parts. I, I, too many slides, I think it's eight or eight or nine. You'll, you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's eight or nine. Uh, uh, the first part covers five principles. 
uh, and what Scalia, Scalia and Garner call fundamental principles. And these are very basic things that often aren't said, but I am going to say them. The very first one, principle number one, is what we might call the interpretation principle. Every application of a text to a particular circumstance entails interpretation. Um, interpretation of giving meaning to a specific problem. You have a statute or a code or a contract. You have a problem. How do you extend? How do you apply those words to a given problem? Sounds so basic, but we do this on a daily basis. This is what everyone else learns from the very first day in law school. Chief Justice Marshall, we mock him. Are we, are we okay with Marshall here? I'm okay with him here at least, right? Those who apply the, so at least one prior clerk in the room. Those, those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. This is a very basic principle. Um, a lot of text is plain and unambiguous. Uh, my friend James and Justice Lee were talking this morning. There are a lot of questions where the text is beginning and the end. You don't have to go anywhere else. It's like, ah, oh, clear as day. That's the answer. Um, but there are other cases where language is not plain. And the language may be ambiguous. And that's where the hard work comes in. But at least start with a basic principle. Um, the second principle is what they call the supremacy of text principle. The words of a governing text are paramount concern. And what they convey in their context is what the text means. And jurists, no less than Benjamin Cardozo, recognize that you don't go beyond the borders of the statute. Well, maybe they do now, but they're not supposed to. Now you would say, wait a minute, Josh, don't textualists consider purpose? They do, but I want to make this point clear at the outset. Textualism and purposivism have an important distinction. For textualists, the purpose of a document is the context helps to give words meaning, right? You're using purpose to give meaning to the words. So let me give you an example. You have the word draft in a document. Does that mean a banknote or a breeze? The subject matter of the text can tell you which definition is better. But there are limits which Scalia and Garner give. I'll give you four of them. First, you have to derive the purpose from the text and not from extrinsic sources like legislative history or maybe an assumption of the drafter's desires. Second, the purpose must be defined precisely and not in a fashion that smuggles in the answer to the question before the decision maker. Third, you have to describe the purpose as concretely as possible, not in the abstract, like fairness or justice or anything like that. And fourth, as a general matter, you cannot use purpose to contradict text or to supplement it. In other words, you can't say, aha, we know what the purpose is, so we'll disregard the text. Purpose from the text doesn't resolve at the outset. You know that you read if you disagree in court, and they often invert it. Always invert this. I can give you cases later if you want. Purpose sheds light only in deciding which of various textually permissible meanings should be adopted. You have to remember, no text pursues its purpose at all costs. Okay. The third principle is called the principle of interla interrelating canon. This is one you probably have heard of and maybe have a misconception about. No canon is absolute. Each canon can be overcome by the strength of different principles that point in other directions. Justice Breyer says, cans are not mandatory rules. Now, who here heard of the article by Carl Llewellyn about the dueling canons? Okay, a bunch of hands went up. I read this one in law school also. Um, I encourage you to read in the Scalia Garner chapter their discussion of the Llewellyn article. I'll just give a brief overview here. Um, Professor Llewellyn had an influential article where he said that <clears throat> there are always two opposing canons on almost every point. He was a realist trying to show that this entire textualism enterprise is bunk, right? You give me canon A, I'll give you canon B, and they shoot in opposite directions. Um, but the problem is a lot of Llewellyn's cans are basically made up. Um, Scalia and Garner said, we haven't heard of most of them, right? You know, 
Just because a judge somewhere used a canon doesn't mean it's a canon, right? Canon means generally well accepted. And other canons well in use actually reject textualism, right? Now, there are some canons that can sometimes point in different directions. This should not surprise you, right? Very often, depending on how you read a document, two interpretations are plausible. Scalia and Gardner say the fact that the maxims may work against each other does not establish the hopeless confusion posited by Llewellyn's model. It is simply a matter of competing inferences drawn from the evidence, right? Again, if you're at bottom trying to figure out which canon is better, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the hard work of statutory construction. You should not presume that you say, well, you know what? This is hard. Let me just figure out purpose and be done with it and do whatever the hell I want, right? That, that's what the temptation is. Um, maybe you can't figure it out, and you do have to go to purpose, and judges do that. But you should resist it and try to scratch and claw your way to get there. Don't just start there. Okay? Uh, the fourth principle is what's known as presumption against ineffectiveness. A textually permissible interpretation that furthers rather than obstructs the document's purpose should be favored. Okay, and I'll give you an example of this, right? So say you have a statute that says no drinking saloon may exist within a mile of any schoolhouse. And someone wants to open up a schoolhouse. So then the owner of the saloon seeks an injunction to block the construction of the schoolhouse. Okay? And the court says, aha, the schoolhouse has to be moved. You can't build a schoolhouse near a drinking saloon. Um, this is a case where the clear purpose of the statute is to protect the schoolhouses, right? It says no drinking saloon may exist. It doesn't say no school may exist within a mile of the schoolhouse. It says no saloon may exist within a mile of any schoolhouse, right? The text tells you the purpose. And by construing it the other way, you've rendered the statute ineffective, right? In this way, there can never be any school near a school uh, near near a drinking saloon, right? That's not what the text itself says. Number five, this presumption. I'm sorry. This principle is known as the presumption of validity. Generally, we prefer an interpretation that validates one over an interpretation that invalidates. What does that mean? Well, you often see this in the constitutional context, right? You prefer a statute, I'm oh, sorry, you prefer a reading of a statute that renders a statute constitutional. But this is in no way limited to constitutional law. I'll give you a very boring example. I teach property. Let's say you have a will, and one interpretation would lead to a violation of the rule against perpetuities. You didn't get, you didn't get wrapped today, right? You can read a will one way with a violation of wrap, rule against perpetuities. Or you can read it well another way, which is consistent with the rule against perpetuities, right? Which construction you prefer? You prefer the construction that validates, where, the, where, where there's not a wrap violation. Or maybe a more modern example, right? Let's say you have an arbitration clause in a contract. One reading of the contract renders the arbitration clause unenforceable. Another reading renders the arbitration clause enforceable. Uh, we prefer readings that lead to validity. That, that things are valid. And this is, uh, again, not just in the con law context, but you see elsewhere as well. Okay. The next 10 or so canons are what is, what is known as principles of semantics, which refers to meaning of words. Okay. Excuse me. Number six may seem very The ordinary meaning canon. Words are to be understood in their ordinary context, I'm sorry, in their, in their ordinary unless the context indicates that they bear a technical sense. Um, this might sound like originalism to you, and it frankly is, but this is not limited to any sort of governmental document. Um, this principle also is not new. One of the few good quotes from Gibbons v. Ogden, oh, sorry, it's my, oh, I slipped. I said, Josh, don't do con law today. So I didn't hire me to do it. So a good quote from Gibbons, Marshall wrote, 
the enlightened patriots who framed our Constitution and the people who adopted it must be understood to have employed words in their natural sense and to have intended what they have said. Okay, and this is, by the way, Thomas Gibbons, if you want to know who he is. Um, Joseph Story wrote in his great commentaries, every word employed in the Constitution is to be expounded in its plain, obvious, and common sense, unless the context furnishes some ground to control, qualify, or enlarge it. Constitutions are not designed for metaphysical or logical subtleties, for niceties of expression, for, cr for critical propriety, for elaborate shades of meaning, or for the exercise of philosophical acuteness or judicial research. They're instruments of a practical nature, founded in the common business of human life, adapted to common wants, designed for common use, and fitted for common understanding. I love that quote. Um, it says everything in just like a paragraph. Start with ordinary meaning. Okay? It's not just ordinary meaning. The meaning of a word is fixed. This is not a seminar on originalism, uh, but I will deviate slightly. Uh, there's something known as a fixation thesis, which understands that words have a fixed meaning unless otherwise changed. Um, my friend James is here. Uh, uh, we have in language what's called linguistic drift, right? Where the phrase domestic violence in the Constitution had one meaning. And the phrase domestic violence in our common parlance means something else. If I say domestic violence today, I mean spousal abuse, things of that nature. Uh, domestic violence back then meant insurrection, rebellion, and the like. Um, the meaning of words changes, and there's nothing wrong with that. The difficulty is capturing meaning at the time it was fixed, and that's the enterprise of originalism. Just as Frankfurter said, words must be read with the gloss of those, I'm sorry, gloss of the experience of those who frame them. Courts do this all the time, right? But generally, we don't deal with old documents, right? Most contracts have a shelf life of maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Maybe a trust has a 50-year lifespan. But generally, most documents live and die within a couple generations. Uh, but constitutions endure far longer, right? We now have a 230-something-year-old document. And we don't use words the same way we might have done in the 1780s. We don't use the same grammatical constructions. We don't use the same uh, uh, syntactic preferences. Things are different. And it's important to understand how words were understood at the time. OK, let's move away from originalism for at least a few minutes and go back to normal stuff. By the way, the Scalia and Garner book, it's not a comma book, but they smuggle in a lot of comma. You can see where Scalia's angry at things. Just if you read the book carefully, you can see subtle things where Scalia gets very agitated. He'll, he'll say, he's like, well, I agree with the majority, but I dissented. He'll say things like that. It's very good. My favorite one was that Justice Stevens used the right canon, but he reached the wrong result. He had a little footnote about that. OK. Number eight, what's called the omitted case canon. Um, nothing is to be added to what the text states or reasonably implies. That is, a matter not covered by the text is to be treated as not covered. Um, judges and law clerks have this presumption that every statute answers every question. That if there's a question to be had, statute answers it. Um, that's just not accurate. Um, Congress and state legislatures don't anticipate every conceivable problem. Right? Courts can't insert words into provisions that were omitted. If something was omitted, you treat it as omitted, right? We start from the presumption that courts don't know. Um, often courts try to reconstruct what the legislature would have wanted. Now look at our severability jurisprudence for a hint. Disaster, train wreck, right? We don't know what they would have wanted because we don't know, we weren't there, right? We can't imagine the bargains they would have made and how legislation would look. This is why, sorry, the Thomas dissent in Murphy, I think is so important because it deviates from this imaginative reconstruction myth, which has always given me a lot of anxiety, right? Just as Brandeis said, to supply omissions transcends the judicial function. Brandeis got that one right, as did Frankfurter, right? Whatever temptations a statementship or policymaking might wisely suggest, construction must eschew interpolation, evisceration, evisceration. The judge must not read in by way of creation. And that's actually a very influential article by Frankfurter. 
Uh, the court cites it every now and then. Robertson and King v. Burwell, among other cases, very important article. You, you, you'll see it everywhere. Okay, nine. Oh, we've got a Scalia one, right? The general terms canon. And that one says general terms are to be given their general meaning. Now, what case does Scalia quote for this principle in his book? Ankali. Ankali? I say it's Ankali, right? Uh, you're probably been following the Title VII Soji case, this term, right? The because of sex language in Title VII, does that refer to sexual orientation or gender identity? And Scalia wrote what I think is the leading precedent that the plaintiffs relied on in those cases. Uh, Ankali involved sexual harassment, but the facts were a little bit different, right? You had a guy who worked on an oil rig with an eight-man crew. And he was being sexually harassed by his male co-workers. Scalia wrote the majority opinion, and the plaintiff prevailed. The court said there was no textual basis for limiting protections of Title VII to women. The court acknowledged that male-on-male -male sexual harassment in the workplace was not the principal evil Congress was concerned with when enacted Title VII but the stature provision was probably worded. So uh, just keep an eye on that one, see what they're doing across the street, see what happens there. Number 10, uh, you probably cite this in contracts. I'm gonna botch this. Expressio unius est exclusio alterius, right? The expression of one thing implies exclusion of others. So let's say you see a sign at a park that says no dogs allowed. Does that mean you can bring in a monkey, a pig, a baby elephant? No, right? We have to use common sense in some cases. And this is where context might come in. Dogs are specifically addressed because of the animals that are most likely to be brought in, right? So the expresso unius can, you can say, works, but you have to recognize the way things might look with context. That this is one way where there's absolutely dueling canons with expressio unius canon. Okay. Uh, number 11 is the mandatory permissive canon. All right. Mandatory words impose a duty. Permissive words grant discretion. The usual rule is that shall, like in the Second Amendment, imposes a duty. And words like may suggest there's discretion to be had. Uh, but again, this rule, of course, has caveats. The word will or shall can sometimes suggest a mere, uh, uh, what, what's called futurity, right? You shall do something means, okay, do it tomorrow. Or you will do something, that means you'll do it tomorrow, right? It merely describes when something happens, not what must be happened. And I, I've been actually persuaded that at the time of the framing, shall did not have the sort of mandatory sense we have today. It involved like an obligation, you know, he shall do this tomorrow, right? He shall get the State of the Union. Does he have to do it? I think he'll just do it later. So this one I think is a little bit overblown, but you know, take it for what you will. All right. Uh, number 12, well, school house rock, right? Conjunction, junction. Conjunctive, disjunctive, canon. Your function. Um, at least you got that one. Um, ends and ors are very important words. Okay? End, A and D, con uh, A and D joins a conjunctive list or is a disjunctive list. Okay? It gets messy though when you have negatives and plurals. And I'll give you an example that screws up every single con law student ever. There are two provisions of the Constitution that reference privileges and immunities, okay? Article four says the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, okay? Then you have the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall bridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Why is one privileges and another privileges or? The second one begins with no. Right, it's a negative. 
And usually when you have the neither nor, right, when you begin with a negative, you usually take the or version. Super important. You can see this in various texts, like being with a, a no. Okay? All right. Number 13, super, I'm sorry, subordinating. There's a word you may have never seen, superordinating. They're antonyms, right? Subordinate is the opposite of superordinate. Okay, go figure. Okay. Subordinating language usually has the phrase subject to. Okay. So let's use this example. Let's say you have statute number one that says no minors may be admitted. And you have statute number two that says all persons may be admitted subject to statute number one. Right? That's fine, right? You can do that. That still means that minors may be admitted. All right. Now you have super ordinating language, which usually has the signal notwithstanding. So we have number one says all minors may be admitted notwithstanding number one, right? The notwithstanding merely reaffirms the super, right? It reaffirms number one. And here too, the subject to, right? Merely references back to number one. When you see these words, subject to and notwithstanding, that's fine, right? This merely shows what happens if there's a clash. But when you have these words, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a clash. Uh, you often have very sloppy drafting, right, where people don't use these phrases correctly, and they may lead to a clash. But as a general matter, you can have these phrases without any problems. Okay. The next one, the gender number canon. This one, I think, you probably would need to update the chapter. I understand that we're not getting another edition of this book. There was actually another edition in the works that we'll never see live day. Uh, it's just as clear as but this would be a chapter that probably would get, get an edition. Uh, historically, grammarians and lexicographers have said that the masculine pronoun, he, included the feminine. He, him, could be masculine or feminine. All right? Today, some people use he or she, or they perhaps use other pronouns as well. Uh, debate for another day. But in the absence of a contraindication, the masculine includes the feminine, and the singular includes the plural. And today I'll add the plural includes a singular. They is now a singular pronoun. You'll see it. Okay. Number 15, the presumption of the non-exclusive include. Generally, the word include is used to issue things in a list, but it's not exhaustive. So if I said dangerous weapons, including, you know, bombs and guns, etc. Those aren't the only types of dangerous weapons I am mentioning. Now let me give you a pet peeve. The word include comprise is exhausting. So if you use the word comprise, you better list all the examples, which means don't use the word comprise. Right? You're probably going to screw it up. Just don't use the word because it, it, it's, it's, it's seldom you can actually use comprise correctly, so just don't use it. Use, exclu use include. I just saved you a red line and some clerk memo. But, you know, you, you pick stuff up along the way and you learn things. Uh, maybe you're larvae editors, there are all these stupid rules that actually matter. Uh, um, and uh, you, you can tell opinions that chambers follow these sorts of things and chambers that don't. You can read them very quickly. And the ones that do get green bag awards and the ones that don't get unpublished. Uh, it's true. You, you figure out very quickly uh, the, the attention to detail. Within, you can read the first paragraph of an opinion. You know what's going on. Okay. Um, this one is often uh, uh, confused with the absurdity canon. They're different. I'll do absurdity a little bit later. But this one says that unintelligible text is inoperative. And we have a great quote from Roscoe Pound, who was a dean at Nebraska, among other things. Uh, there are sometimes statutes which no rule or canon of interpretation can make effective or applicable to the situation which they purport to govern. In such cases, the statute must simply fail. Okay? Statute fails. 
courts should do everything in their power to avoid getting to this result. Um, you can't just start thinking, man, this statute makes no sense. Statutes are messy. Maybe there were amendments made. You have to go through a lot of these works um, to decide. And sometimes courts can simply say, well, the statute's ambiguous. That means we defer. This is the Chevron debate you're probably familiar with. Right? Uh, there's nothing illegitimate by saying the statute is unintelligible. Defer to the experts. Maybe they know better. Uh, but, but you have to, I think, hesitate before getting to this level. OK? Welcome. All right, we're done with part one, OK? Next, we move on to what are called the syn syntactic canons, the syntactic canons. Yeah, Jim? I, I don't want to ask questions. I'll never finish. At the end, at the end, I promise. I'll do my best to remind you. If I take questions, I'll never finish. All right, because you're all really smart. Uh, Syntactic canons are based on uh, uh, things like grammar. So number 17 is called the grammar canon, which might sound obvious. But we presume that drafters use the rules of grammar. That might be a very risky presumption. People make mistakes all the time. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. But we presume that those writing laws, those writing contracts, those writing deeds, wills, adhere to the usual rules of grammar. All right? Even if this presumption is not accurate, Scalia and Garner say it's unshakable. We're stuck with it. I like it. Okay? You know, you have these hashtag math hats, you know, hashtag grammar hats, right? You know, we'll, we'll have our own candidate one day, right? Um, number 18. Um, this is a Principally private thought since the seventh grade or so, but it refers to the relationship between pronouns and antecedents, right? The antecedents were that comes before. And this was actually a major con law case that could resolve with grammar. So you might remember in 1841, uh, President Harrison uh, gave a, a two hour inauguration in the rain. He attracted pneumonia and he died. This was the first time a president had died in office. What happens? Now, just look at the text of Article 2, Section 1, the succession clause. It says, in case of uh, removal of the president from office or his death, the resignation, or ability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. Now, the same, right? That's a pronoun, right? The same. What does that refer to? Does that refer to the powers and duties of the, so the powers and duties, or the office which includes the powers and the duties? This is not a trivial thing. At the time, people thought, well, you can exercise the powers of the presidency, but you're not the president. In other words, we'd have to have some other election to pick a president. It's not you. All right? The last antecedent canon basically says the pronoun, right, you refer to the, the nearest reasonable antecedent, which is office, which in that case would mean that the office devolved onto the vice president, and that's how Tyler became president. And I think that's probably right as a matter of original meaning also, but here grammar actually gives you the rule of decision. Okay. Um, the fourth one is called the series qualifier canon. Okay. So the classic example here is the Fourth Amendment. Oh, it's hard to read, sorry. Unreasonable searches and seizures. Does unreasonable modify only search? Or does unreasonable modify seizure as well? Uh, uh, this canon says when you have a parallel construction, searches and seizures, the, the, the propositive, the modifier, modifies both of them. There's unreasonable searches and unreasonable seizures, right? It's not just modifying the first one, okay? All right, this one's a little bit trickier. Um, what happens when you don't have a neat phrase search and seizure, right? You don't have these parallel nouns and verbs. The propositive, what does it actually modify? So Scalia and Garner have this statute in the book. Uh, they mentioned the Prohibition Era statute. 
and it says the provisions of this act shall not be construed to prevent any person from manufacturing for his domestic consumption at his home, wine or cider for fruit of his own raising. Okay. So what does this statute actually mean? Does this apply to manufacturing at his home or consumption at his home? Or both, right? What if you manufacture it somewhere else and you drink at home? Right? Or what if you Okay. Um, the court in Virginia, I think, probably got it wrong. Uh, but Scalia says this does not modify both. Right? Only modifies domestic consumption, that is drinking your wine at home. In other words, it doesn't matter where you manufacture it. But you can see how the reading of the statute would apply to a case where a person made some wine on his farm. If you have it modifying both of them, the person can put it. Right? Depending on how you read the statute. Right? One was called the proviso. Um, a proviso condition. Right? So usually you have. Uh, a, a clause that introduces a condition, and usually the word provided there, right? So that, that, that whatever the condition is, it comes after the word provided. This one doesn't come up too often. All right, um, 20, what's called the scope of subparts canon. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the United States Code. Um, indentation matters. Uh, uh, it matters in very big ways. And depending what section or subsection you're in of the outline, just so you know this, right? You have room number one, capital A, number one, letter A. You know what comes after letter A, small a? What's it called? Romanette. Say it? Romanette. Romanette, exactly. With I period, I, I period, it's called Romanettes. John Roberts used that in opinions, I mean, argument, but it's called a Romanette. Uh, you have to pay attention to these, because very often you have like a 40 page statute, and the, the indentation matters. So on this little uh, 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 graphic over here, the material within an indented part, so that's A, B, and C, relates only to that subpart. Okay. Materials contained in unindented text, like the one up here, relates to everything below. Okay. A and Congress is not very neat about this, and it's not always clear, but you can use this as a general guide. Okay. And if you see in letter C, there's this little if clause in C, it's hard to read, that only applies to C. Okay. Another one, the punctuation. Punctuation is a permissible indicator of meaning. Um, there are some contracts in which millions of dollars are lost based on the placement of a comma. This is not trivial. Scalia has an example in his book, uh, Scalia has an example in his book where there was some contract and a comma before notwithstanding changed the entire meaning. Millions of dollars were lost. Uh, so punctuation will usually not change the meaning, but it can, it can determine whether a modifying phrase applies to part of a sentence or the entirety of a sentence. And for whatever reason, lawyers love commas and semicolons, right? And Oh God, M dashes. Oh, use those sparingly, my friends. Uh, 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 Judge Batchelder maybe will give you lessons, but most people don't use M dashes correctly. Uh, and they make sentences very hard to read. I, I used to use them a lot and I regret it. Uh, so, so, so take my words caution, don't use them. Make nice short sentences. My current rule, and if you read my 100 cases book, you'll see this. Every sentence is one subject and one verb. If I want anything else, I add a period. Rudy and I, we fought for months, but it makes it so much easier to read. Every sentence, one subject, one verb. There's, n there's no doubt. You get to a period, you know, None of these long three or four commas and semicolons and m dashes and parentheticals. My God, double parentheticals. See those double two parentheses, one with each other. Just stop. And the explanatory footnotes. Just stop. I, and my other rule is anything that's more than a sentence is above the line. If it's more than a sentence, it's not a footnote. But, but take that for what it's worth. I, some judges don't use footnotes at all. Uh, that that's actually a, a a thing which appellate judges don't always agree on. Um, check your side of your chambers. It's it's something that people. Can reasonably disagree. We did not agree. We love them. So even very smart people disagree. But it goes both ways. All right. Oh, we have Suter. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> he was in there a couple times, actually. Suter was actually a decent common law judge. I, in property, I have one of his property decisions from the New Hampshire Supreme Court. It was a good. He actually wrote a good. 
actual that was why they picked him, right? It was, it was a case on a breach of contract, something silly. But you know, anyway. So you got you got a good suitor opinion from '93. All right. Part four. Never again. Part four. <laughs> Principles twenty-four to sorry, sorry. <laughs> I can't help it. Principles twenty-four to thirty-seven. What we call the tech contextual canons. Oh, we got Kennedy also. Why not? Uh, Eighty-eight early uh, vintage. Might be his first term actually. Um, this one sounds obvious, uh, but but we need to say it. Um, you have to construe a text as the whole, right? You have to look at the part of the statute issue, but the entire statute. Why is this so hard? Because statutes are really long. I think it's something like the Affordable Care Act, right? Something I've written about at some length. It's a 3,000 page statute, right? And then you have a case where it's like established by the state. What does that mean? And you have all the other provisions that you have to understand. So you can't only really read part of the statute. The context is very important. In McCulloch v. Maryland, Chief Justice Marshall said you need a fair construction of the whole instrument. Cardozo said the meaning of the statutes we look for not in any single section, but in all the parts together and in their relation to the end in view. Okay? Um, this is related to the idea that if a phrase is used in one statute, you see how it's used in other statutes. It's a similar concept, but you have to look elsewhere. You can't just look at the provision that's being challenged. Okay, 25. Ah, that's my favorite horseman, uh, Justice Sutherland. Do you all have a favorite horseman? There were four horsemen, right? Sutherland, Butler, McReynolds, and Van Vander. He's my favorite. You can read my book and figure out why, okay? The, the presumption of consistent usage. Words or phrases are presumed to bear the same meaning throughout a text, and if there's some material variation, that suggests the meaning was also varied, right? Um, where you have a document that uses a term in one place, you presume it's the same meaning when the document uses the word in another place. That sounds very obvious. But let's say a word is slightly modified. That modification is significant because it shows there was some intelligence, some intention to deviate from the meaning. And those are actually very useful. Okay, number twenty-six. This is an important one that people often have difficulty with. What's called the surplusage canon. Um, if it's possible, given effect, I will not try the Latin. I promise. Um, none should be ignored. None should needlessly be given interpretation, as it is to duplicate another provision or to have no consequences. All right. Now, this presumption is based on assumption that drafters know what they're doing, that they take care to remove any possible surplusage, right? That they take care to choose their words carefully. They don't. Those guys over there, right? Guys and girls. They don't. They don't, right? The statutes are cobbled together with obvious, and no one knows what's in it, right? But we still apply this. Presumption. Um, Scalia and Garner explain it this way. They say, this canon is well known. Statutes should be carefully drafted and encouraging courts to ignore sloppily inserted words results in legislative free writing and increasingly slipshod drafting. In other words, if the courts stop using these canons, it will create incentives for a legislature to be sloppier. Okay, I buy it. I, I think it's good, right? Uh, one of the great jurists said, the courts must lean in favor of a construction which will render every word operative rather than one which may make some idle and nugatory. And there's some language in Marbury to the same effect. Okay? And we, have we have Cooley again. He was the, on, the, on the chief justice of the Michigan Supreme Court in the 1860s. This one's number 27, the harmonious reading <coughs> excuse me, canon. The provisions of a text should be interpreted in a way that renders them compatible, not contradictory. Cooley said, one part is not allowed to defeat another part if by any reasonable construction the two can be made to stand together. So again, we have a, we have a presumption that when a person is drafting a text, section A is meant to be harmonious with section B. Um, but that's not always the case. 
And there might be some instances where the readings are uh, in conflict. And another case where the readings are incon irreconcilable. We'll do those two next. Okay, general specific. Oh, we got Bentham here. Everyone know this is this one, right? Jeremy Bentham was a famous English philosopher, and for reasons I don't fully understand, he wanted his body put on display at, at the University of College London, right? So basically, they stuffed his body with hay, and they put it in a box, basically a phone booth, on display. That's a wax head. But the actual head is on display every now and then. They tried to mummify him. It, it's grotesque. Just Google it. Bentham head. It looks like, like some sort of horror movie. But th this was... But look, Scalia and Garner quote him a number of times favorably, so I can't be too mad at him. But just, it, this is a weird dude, okay? <laughs> anyway, but Bentham wrote a commentary on Blackstone's commentaries and had some, I think, trenching criticisms of Blackstone. So for one principle, right? If there's a conflict between a general provision and a specific provision, the specific provision prevails. Okay? I'll give you an example. Let's say you have two signs at a park. One sign says no wheel vehicles. And then a second sign says bicycles and baby carriages may be walked along the paths. Ah, so we have our vehicles problem again, right? No wheel vehicles would mean you can't have a bicycle or baby carriage. But the second sign says oh, you can have a bicycle and baby carriage if you stay on the path. We prefer the specific example over the general prohibition, okay? You prefer the specific over the general. All right, next. All right, this one is when you have the you know, Gordian knot, right? You cannot un 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 unravel it, okay? What happens if you have a text that contains truly irreconcilable provisions at the same level of generality? and they were adopted simultaneously. Okay, so what do you do here? Some courts might say, aha, we'll get provisions A precedence, we'll just ignore provision B. Or you might say, aha, no, we'll ignore provision A and we'll give meaning to provision B. Scalia and Garner say, neither. If they are truly irreconcilable, they can't exist without each other. That this was a single statute and we can't pick and choose which elements we want. This is sort of the rejection of modern severability doctrine, which I, again, I'm with Thomas in this one, right? Um, we, we can't, is there an Engelhardt clerk here somewhere? The list? Yeah. We can't cut up a statute like you have a carcass and you read the taxidermy. He had a comment during an argument recently. Uh, it was a pretty big case, right? You, you can't slice and dice a statute like you would your taxidermy a, a, a wildebeest, right? You can't do that. All right? So I think this is a good canon to have. But again, I think courts will rarely, rarely reach this conclusion. Generally, you can do something with it to avoid getting, this is like your, you know, your, your plan Z, there's nothing left to do. Um, and maybe the answer here is you just defer to the agency, defer to the executive, that's your tiebreaker. But you might have this in like a will or a document where, you know, provision A says property goes to Johnny, and provision B says property goes to Sally, you can't give it to both of them. So maybe neither gets it using the intestacy statute, right? You find some other way to resolve it. All right. Number 30. An hour and right on schedule. About 30 after an hour. Yeah. Yeah, right on schedule. I have a rough clock, mate. I, I've, you know, with a marathon, you never do the full marathon until the day of, so I haven't done this straight through, but I'm more or less timing it. Okay. I haven't done this before, by the way. For first time. Hopefully it's enjoyable so far. I'm honest, I try. Number 30, uh, the Predicate Act Canon. Um, generally, when you authorize an act, you have to authorize the Predicate Act, what's necessary. Um, this one sounds obvious, right? Bentham said that command includes permission, right? If you command someone to do something, then you permit it to be done, right? You know, it would make little sense to draft an instrument that says, a person both shall and may do an act. If you must do something, then you're allowed to do it, right? When you have a general power conferred, all the powers necessary exist. By the way, this is the basis of necessary and proper clause. I, I know you think, oh, con law, 
Our Constitution is a reflection of basic human nature. If you have the power to do X, you should also have the power necessary and proper to do X, right? It's just a simple implication. Now, whether it's expressly necessary or absolutely necessary, we can argue, but this is a very basic tenement of, 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 of the written, of written word. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, we got Stevens, look at that. All right, uh, this is an old school stuff. I think Scalia picked all old decisions from early in their tenures. Early Kennedy, early Souter. Look at that. The Associated Words Canon. Oh, God. Any classics majors here? How do you say this one? Noskatara Sokis. So you do a Sokis with like a K. I've heard it with a Ch, also, a Sochis. Sokis. Okay. Church. Church. I'm Jewish. What do I know? So no, no scripture of Sokis, they did that? Okay. And, and by the way, you're on deck for this one in a minute, okay? <laughs> no scripture of Sokis, right? The associated words, my co-clerk, my clerk was a, was a classic. So this Latin and Greek stuff, he was very good, so I didn't have to do any of that stuff. Um, associated words canon, right? Associated words bear on one another. So words grouped in a list should have a similar meaning, right? Birds of a feather flock together, right? Things should be uh, judged by what is nearby. Um, this one isn't that controversial. Words grouped in a list should be given related meanings. Okay. There's another one that's similar. Yes. A eustem and eris. Thank you. A eustem and eris, right? I, uh, <laughs> don't, it's good enough, okay? Where general words follow an enumeration of two or more things, they apply only to persons or things of the same general kind. So, for example, if I said horse, cow, dog, cat, and other animals, you put the word similar in there because you presume that the types of animals you're referring to are similar to horses, cows, dogs, cats, and animals. Right? What is the common thread here? The common thread here is domestication. Right, they're all domesticated animals. So would you put elephant in that category or lion? Probably not. Would you put, you know, hamster? Yeah, you can probably put hamster, right? You know, would you put, you know, chickens? Yeah, you can probably put chickens in there, but you, you, you're not put a zebra in there. Right? So the a Eustum and Eris? Ganeris. Oh, Ganeris. Sorry, Ganeris, right? This means that you have to uh, uh, see what are the types of things that are listed together. This one is, is used a lot. I think people often use it incorrectly, so you can at least check the Scalia example. They have some very good um, examples. So he has one in his book. Uh, could you include a protozoa in the list of animals? No, no protozoa. They do not fit. Okay. Uh, the distributive phrasing canon. All right. This one is a little trickier. Uh, distributed phrasings apply each expression to its appropriate referent. So Scalia and Garner have this example in their book. Men and women are eligible to become members of fraternities and sororities. Does this mean that men can be members of sororities and women can be members of fraternities? I don't think so. I don't think it's the best reading of this statute, right? Uh, you don't need any word, but the context alone spells it. But sometimes you'll see the word each, every, per, respective, right? Words like each, every, every, these sorts of words, distribute the modifier, okay? All right, next one involves prefatory materials. Scalia, I'm probably a little tough, for <laughs> there's a little anxiety writing this sentence, right? Um, a preamble, what's often called a purpose clause or recital, is a permissible, permissible indicator of meaning. You know what was in the back of his mind here, of course, which was, the Second Amendment, uh, Heller, uh, which begins a well-regulated militia, being comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be. It was relation between the preamble and the operative clause. Uh, Heller disagreed vigorously on this one, but in many cases, you could look to the preamble or the prologue or the recitals to provide context of the meaning. Usually they're added for some purpose. Uh, there, there's some evidence at the time of the framing 
the linkage between the preamble and the operative clause was not as strict. For example, in the Northwest Territories Act, uh, there's one provision that says something like, education's very important to a free republic, comma, there should be schools in the territories. In other words, even if you disagree with what's in the preamble, the operative clause is clear. So that's Heller. But as a general matter, we can give recitals some weight. Okay. Uh, this one's a little trickier, right? The title and headings canon. Um, this one says the title and headings are permissible indicators of meaning. So let's just take one of my favorite statutes, EDPA. The Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Has EDPA made death penalties more effective? Don't answer that. <laughs> Too many GVRs for my home circuit, right? Um, no, it's made it really complicated, right? It's the exact opposite. So I don't know how much weight um, uh, uh, th this has, right? Is it affordable health care? I mean, you know, just s statutes. <laughs> if I had my druthers, I would give all laws numbers. Because any statute, how can you vote against affordable health care? What kind of monster are you, right? Uh, and, or the, the, the John Doe Remembrance Act, the person who died. How can you vote against a person who died, right? Why would you vote against a person who died? So I would give all bills numbers. That way there's no campaign. He voted against Bill 74. Who cares? Uh, so I would, I, would remove, I would remove all, you can't, or even just, you can't name a bill after a person who's dead. Just, just don't do it, because we do for the Gipper, right, for, you know, for, for, for remembering, and it's bad. But Scalia and Garner say uh, that headings may be useful. Now, the title of the bill, not so much, but section headers, those are useful, right? And you can look to section headers. Um, there are some states that tell you that you cannot use section headers as symbols of interpretations. If you have a, if it, if you have a, a state case, move on. By the way, you'll want to uh, you'll want to abolish the diversity jurisdiction after your first year of clerking. They'll say, "Why am I dealing with these state cases? I don't care." Trust me, it'll hit you. I I had three traffic traffic accidents go to trial. I had car accidents on the interstate filed in federal court, and three went to trial in one year. I would abolish diversity. Uh, have like a million dollar man in controversy, fine, but to just, just, you know, get rid of most of it, just, you know. You'll get that when you have to go through a state statute book, it goes, wow, Congress is messed up, but this is some bad stuff, right? <laughs> you'll, you'll recognize like, wow, these US code's pretty good compared to whatever revised statutes of your state, right? You'll, I love state law, uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll get there at some point this, this term. I got, I, I got there in my third car accident case. Okay, we had an interstate that went right through our jurisdiction, so we had all the car accident cases. All right, number 36, we're actually halfway done, right on schedule, okay. The interpretive direction canon, okay. Some statutes have what are called definition sections, right, where they define certain terms. Uh, those statutes are your friends. Some statutes give interpretation clauses that says, here's how you read the statute or there might be a severability clause, or there might be some provision that tells you how to construe part A and part B. Um, those statutes are your friends, because there is some evidence in the text from the drafter that they actually thought about these issues, and they're telling future parties how to deal with them. And this is not just in government documents. Any will, any contract, any M&A agreement, whatever it is, will define terms. Those should be carefully followed, okay? Those should be carefully followed. We don't deviate for those lightly. All right, number 37 is one of the most misused in the entire book, right? Absurdity in this context doesn't mean, oh, that can't be right, right? I get this all the time. Josh, how could you possibly believe that's absurd? I get that a lot, right? That's not what absurd means. You can only disregard some text if failing to do so results in a disposition that no reasonable person could approve. Now again, that's not a reasonable person could agree with it. I'll make that very clear, right? We're not trying to persuade the reasonable person. The reason why this issue is in court is because people disagree. Reasonable parties disagree. The question here is, can they approve? It's like, all right, you know what? I, I disagree, but that, that's in the, no, that's fine, I guess, right? Even a dissenting judge will often say, you know, I disagree, but I dis dissent respectfully, right? This canon should, should never be invoked. It's, it's, it's a bad idea. 
Um, if someone took the time to draft a document that leads to a result that you don't like, then th that's the problem of the person who drafted the document. And that's not a license for courts in particular. Uh, now there are some exceptions, like a Scrivener's error, right? Right, let's say they misspell a word. Right, Scalia gives an example. So the word third party. What if they wrote third partly? Third partly. Well, then the statute becomes entirely incomprehensible. I will entertain that a court can say they meant third party. Because third partly would just make the statute completely insane. It would make no sense who that person is. Right? But this is to correct obviously unintended dispositions, not to revise a purposeful disposition that, in the light of other provisions of the code, makes little sense. Lots of statutes are stupid, right? Scalia famously had a, had a stamp that said, was it stupid but constitutional? And just stamp all these statutes. And maybe you should have one of those in chambers. I should keep one on my desk also, right? Lots of laws are dumb. Uh, but that's not a ground to apply the absurdity canon. Okay. All right, moving right along. So far, we've been talking about uh, canons that um, are applicable to governmental texts. I'm sorry, so far we're talking about canons that can be applied to anything. Uh, the remainder of the canons are those <coughs> limited to governmental texts, okay? The rules are a little bit different. And Scalia and Garner identify four, and by the way, I'm taking a break in about maybe five or six minutes. So we'll take a break a little bit. I have, <laughs> I have uh, six more canons and I'll, I'll take a break, I promise. I guess people are getting antsy, right? Uh, Scalia and Garner explain that there's some different rules that you apply when we're dealing with governmental texts. So let's do the first one. Um, the first one applies to canons 38 through 44, what are called the expected meaning canons, the expected meaning canons, right? These are about meaning of text, and usually constitutional text. Number 38 is what's called the constitutional doubt canon, which I am certain you are all familiar with. This is like the one people always know. And it goes like this, a statute should be interpreted in a way that avoids placing its constitutionality in doubt. It extends also where a reading might even raise a question about its constitutionality, right? Now, why does this canon exist? Scalia and Garner have a good discussion here. They say, well, we presume that legislature should not be sailing close to the wind, they say, right? That, that Congress would not enter an area of questionable constitutionality without making that entrance utterly clear. Does anyone believe that? No, of course not, right? Um, dubious. Congress sails close to the wind all the time. Indeed, federal statutes acknowledge they're sailing close to the wind because they have provisions for accelerated judicial review. They might even grant standing to members of Congress, like the Line Item Veto Act, right? And they even have dispositions like, oh, by the way, if you strike down this part, keep the rest of it in play, right? They know they're, they're towing close to the line. Maybe we talk about judicial supremacy later, but Congress does not act in this fashion. But we still presume that they could. Okay. 39, uh, the related statutes canon. Uh, how do you pronounce, how do you do this one? Pare materia? Am I ballpark? Good. Has it? Impar Impar materia. Thank you. I forgot to italicize the N. Ugh, someone's going to kill me, right? Um, actually, well, all right. Impar materia. Thank you. Uh, if a statute uses a word, right, and another statute, we presume that the whole, right, the whole law uses the language in a similar fashion. Uh, but this could also apply to an entire corpus, right? Let's say law number one uses a, a phrase and law number two uses the same phrase. We might presume they have the same context in different statutes. Why? Justice Marshall tells us we generally presume that Congress is knowledgeable about existing laws pertinent to legislation it enacts. 
If that's a good assumption, I don't know, but it's an assumption that exists. All right, number 40, the retroactivity canon. All right, if the legislature amends or reenacts a provision, a significant change in language is presumed to entail a change in meaning. So if you have a statute and then it's amended, and the meaning of that phrase is amended, we make that change have significance. Um, this is a form of legislative history, but not you know, these sort of committee reports. This is what we call statutory history, right? What statutes were enacted or repealed along the way? And we can use these, I think, legitimately. 41, the presumption against retroactivity. Uh, this comes up a lot. Right? We generally presume that statutes have no retroactive effects. Um, and there's some constitutional bases for these, right? We have the ex post facto clauses, the due process clauses, uh, uh, the takings clause has some retroactivity doctrine built in, the contracts clause. We generally presume that they're made only prospectively, prospectively going forward, not retroactively. Uh, now, Congress can adopt rules retroactively but they must, do, they must do so clearly and with a clear statement. <clears throat> this one doesn't come up too often, but it might. Uh, it's called the pending action canon. When a statute is modified during the pendency of a lawsuit, the courts will generally apply the new law. They will generally apply the new law unless doing so would violate the presumption against retroactivity. But there are wrinkles here, right? What if the law modifies jurisdiction? Right? In other words, the statute vested jurisdiction when the lawsuit began, and then along the way the court repealed that statute such that there's no longer jurisdiction. You would use the jurisdiction at the time of the judgment. So the case could actually be dismissed. Right? Um, what if the law modified the statute of limitations mid-lawsuit? That is, it was timely filed under the initial law, but the statute was modified along the way. At that time, you look at the law at the time the suit was filed. Right? And there are some other wrinkles, but uh, uh, this comes up in the Supreme Court every now and then. It's not too common. Okay, 42. Oops. I think my, my numbering... I put 42 after, anyway, I flipped the order, I'm sorry. So just, just I'll fix it later. Uh, 43, the pending action canon. Oh, no, I just did one, right. So for, no, see what happened was 43, 42, 44. I, I, so, okay. Okay, extraterritoriality canon, sorry. I'll fix it later. Uh, generally, we presume that statutes do not have extraterritorial effect. And this is a good canon to have. Um, the United States can regulate their own citizens, and they can regulate their citizens abroad. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we want to see the Congress intend to do it, we require a clear statement, right? We will generally limit statutes to a domestic scope. Okay. Number 44. Um, this one should not be controversial, but it became really controversial in the Hobby Lobby decision. Um, as a general matter, the word person includes corporations, other entities, but not the sovereign. You don't believe me? Look at 1 U.S. Code 1, the very first statute in the U.S. Code. It defines a person as a corporation. 1 U.S.C. 1, this is not controversial to Hobby Lobby. But then fast forward to Hobby Lobby, you have RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. RIFRA gives certain protections to persons with respect to religious liberty. Person. Hobby Lobby is a corporation. Is Hobby Lobby protected by RIFRA? Absolutely. Now, the court actually deviates. They say, well, it's closely held. It's not publicly traded. All right, whatever. But the general principle that a corporation is, a, is, that a, is treated as a person that's not new, that wasn't like invented in the year 2010. Right? This is a fairly long-standing um, a tradition. They were always artificial people. Okay. All right. Let me. It's about 3:22 here. Let me take about a 10-minute break. 
You can go stretch. Uh, and we will resume with governance structure and canons.
back. <clears throat> All right. By the way, this is a. I have to commend John and everyone Heritage. This is a really good program. This did not exist when I was a law clerk. I wish it had. I would have perhaps done a little bit better. Uh, I did one program that was put on by Pepperdine. Anyone doing the Pepperdine program? I thought it was pretty good. It was actually um, uh, uh, it was at, it was at uh, 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 out in Malibu, sunny Malibu. And I, the highlight for me, at least, was um, this was the year before Sotomayor was put in the Supreme Court, so she was still doing it because they put all the judges up in Malibu at this fancy house. Um, and uh, you know, we all just like you know, she was there, and then you know, she's on the Supreme Court a few months later, so it's pretty cool. Um, all right, let's resume. The next part concerns again specific canons that apply to the government. And Scalia and Garner call these government structuring canons. Um, this is one that's very much grounded in the separation of powers. What might be called the repealability canon. And they describe it this way. The legislature cannot derogate for its own authority or the authority of its successors. And Joel Bishop, who was the great writers of law, described one legislature cannot bind a subsequent one. Um, this is an important part. At least in our constitutional system, each branch of government right, gets their power from the Constitution. Um, a single Congress can choose not to exercise that power. Uh, but they cannot abdicate that power for the future. So let's say one president decides to be bound by a statute of dubious constitutionality. And then the next president comes along and decides, I am not going to be bound by it. We have to work very hard to say that the president number one can abdicate or give up in responsibility for president number two. Same with the legislature. Right? If legislature number one decides that they don't have the power to do something, and legislature two decides they can, Congress entity. This works two ways, though. If a Congress tries to pass a statute to limit its own power, right, that can't be done. If, let's say, the Congress enacts a statute limiting the president's veto power, and the president says, you know what, I'll follow this. Let's say Congress enacts a statute that limits the president's war making powers and the war powers resolution. President number one can say, you know what, I'm going to follow this. President number two says, no, I'm not going to follow this. Or let's say, I don't know, Congress enacts a statute limiting the pardon power, right? Even if one president chooses to follow it, the other ones aren't. And here the Supreme Court's pretty clear. One governmental body cannot bind the powers of a subsequent governmental body. Um, <clears throat> this one, I think, is a very important one because far too often Congress wants to constrain one party's branch and the other, and then it goes back and forth. So this cannot be done. Uh, you may sometimes see this called the non-entrenchment doctrine, right, where one party cannot unentrench power. Um, there's a related concept of liquidation, which you should just be familiar with. Um, Madison wrote about liquidation that if you have a, some sort of a long-standing, ongoing practice that perhaps the Constitution remains the same, but we understand it differently. And this came up in Noel Canning, the Recess Appointments Clause case, where you had uh, many presidents making certain types of recess appointments, and Congress didn't formally object. And the court seems to suggest, well, if they keep doing the same thing over and over again, maybe that's the right answer. Uh, I'm with Scalia on that one. No good. Um, 40, uh, by the way, if you don't believe me, I fixed 42, 43, and 44. I don't know how I screw that up. Okay. 46. The presumption against waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, this presumption is at both the federal and the state level. Both the federal government has sovereign immunity from suit, and the states have sovereign immunity from suit. Generally, any waiver of sovereign immunity must be unequivocally clear. Courts will not presume that sovereign immunity is waived lightly. And this is Justice David Brewer. You've probably never heard of him, but he was a very, very prominent constitutional theorist. In fact, he taught at the George Washington Law School, along with Justice Harlan. Who knew this, right? Justice Harlan taught con law while he was in the court. 
How do I know this? I read his lecture notes, right? One of his students transcribed his lectures verbatim. They're at the Library of Congress, or if you want, they're on SSRN. I actually transcribed all of them with uh, two other co-authors. And he would teach Kamla every night after being at the court, which is remarkable. But um, Harlan taught Kamla, law, and I think um, Brewer taught either equities or remedies, some other fun class. So anyway, you have a good GW connection. Um, the Supreme Court has been very consistent on this canon. Um, any waiver of immunity must be expressed, and the court will not do so lightly. Okay? A lot of these actually reflect what you call a clear statement rule, that if Congress wants to do X, they must do so expressly. You see this quite a bit. Okay. 47. We have a general presumption against federal preemption. As I'm sure you all know, we have a supremacy clause. And the supremacy clause says that federal law is the supreme law of the land. Any laws to the contrary in the states have no effect. Um, so when you have a federal law in conflict with a state law, the federal law prevails, as what McCulloch v. Maryland tells us. Um, but when you have this conflict between the federal law and state law, we try to presume that there's not this conflict, that the federal statute merely supplements the state statute. It does not displace the state statute, unless there's some sort of clear command. Um, the court has developed what's called field preemption, which is a disaster for jurisprudence. But in some cases, they'll say, aha, immigration, right? All state laws to the contrary are preempted. Nothing can exist. And uh, Scalia does not agree with that doctrine. He dissented in a case called Arizona versus United States. I'm sorry, I can't do that to Inconvo. It's just it's impossible. Uh, but, but you can see that a lot of these sort of basic principles of statutory interpretation go out the window in certain hot button combo issues. So they, 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 they do exist. Okay. Numbers 48. The private right canon says where the government tries to regulate what might be called private rights. Who here has ever heard of Justice Clifford? Right. He, he was around during the 1860s. He, he was on the quite, he had like a 20, Google me, I think like a 25 year tenure. He was on the bench for quite a bit. He was around. Big, big guy. I mean, he, made, he could have given Taft to run for his money. I don't know. And, 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 um, I'm not making this up. Judge Batchelder, is this correct that at the Sixth Circuit we have just, uh, Judge Taft's chair in the... In the yeah, yeah. It's enormous. It's, it's, it's like... It, it, it's, it's ginormous uh, how big that chair was. And I heard a story once that with, with uh, Chief Justice Taft, he was riding a horse. He broke the horse's ankles. Just that I might be getting the facts slightly off, but he broke the horse's ankles, and apparently someone sent him like a camel or something instead. Like, a, like, please don't, don't ride a horse again. But the guy, the guy was huge. But anyway, he and Clifford can go go pound for pound, I guess, right? <laughs> so, forty-eight penalty illeg illegality canon: um, a statute that penalizes an act makes it unlawful. This is such a basic tenant that it doesn't need to be said. If a statute inflicts a penalty for doing an act, the penalty implies a prohibition and the thing is unlawful, though there is no prohibi prohibitory words in the statute. That's James Kent. This statute applies everywhere except for the Affordable Care Act. I'm sorry, I did it again. <laughs> I did it again. Oh, oops, oops, I did it again. Right? Generally, right, if something is penalized, it's illegal, except going uninsured. That's the, that's the white elephant does not apply to it. It's, it's a unicorn unto itself. Right? Why does this canon matter? Um, you might have a, a, a statute that imposes a penalty for making kind of a contract, right? Because the contract is illegal, it's void, and you can't enforce a void contract fine for having made it, right? So this is a fairly well-established principle, except with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the rule of lenity. Ah, this came up yesterday. Once he just judged Kavanaugh's opinion in, in uh, Schuler. If, you, if you're not in the habit of reading Supreme Court decisions the day they come out, you should get in it, right? Uh, I'm only slightly exaggerating because your judge will ask, what's the opinion today? And you can't say, go read Scott's block. That's, that's not the right answer. <laughs> um, so every, generally at this time of every Tuesday and Wednesday at 10 a.m., there are opinions. And just at least skim the summary, though, to the syllabus at the top. Just, just, just be familiar with it. Uh, but Judge Kavanaugh had an opinion where I think he tried to rewrite the rule of lenity yesterday. Um, and you can see it's like a three-paragraph brief concurrence where you he cites himself. He cites an article he wrote, so there's, there's the authority. Um, <laughs> when you're a judge, you can do it. It's good to be the king, right? Um, the rule of lenity is a fairly old rule. It predates our republic. It's not grounded in our constitution. It's much older than that. 
And it says any ambiguity in a statute defining a crime or imposing a penalty should be resolved in the defendant's favor. Now, you've studied something in contract. Contra preferentum, did I get that mostly right? Good, thank you, name a nod. Contra preferentum, which means when you're interpreting a contract, you draft it against, I'm sorry, you interpret it against the drafter. So if there's a presumption that goes in favor of the drafter, or if you have the other party, you draft, you read it in favor of the other party. Um, and, and this is a, a good statute, uh, I think a good rule, that when you're in the criminal context, an, ambigu an ambiguous statute should be read in the defendant's favor. Uh, Justice Rutledge, uh, he was in the court not very long, Justice Stevens clerk for him, uh, wrote, blurred signposts of criminality will not suffice to create. I think it's a, it's a good quote. Um, again, this statute comes long before our Constitution. It's often grounded in the due process clause. I don't even think that's it. I think this is a very basic principle of what's called fair notice, right? Ignorance of the law is no excuse, but the corollary is the law has to be clear enough that you know it is used against you. Now, of course, this doesn't actually apply anywhere, right? Um, there are so many laws, we don't know what they are. I think, didn't Heritage try and count the number of criminal laws, John? Still working on that. How's, how long is that going on for? But that, you know, it's, it's basically impossible to count all the federal laws and the, the, the regulatory crimes. So this, this statute, um, you know, doesn't have much juice. Uh, and in fact, the court usually rejects it. Um, but what Kavanaugh said in his opinion yesterday is you only get to the rule of lenity uh, if you have like real ambiguity. It has to be really ambiguous. It can't just be, yeah, it's got to be really ambiguous. So I think Kavanaugh has a thing to cut back the rule of lenity. Okay, whatever. I, I don't have a dog in that fight. All right. Mens rea canon, number 50. Uh, you'll probably remember from Crim Law 1L, the concept of mens rea. Uh, that refers to the state of mind. You can have perhaps an intentional, uh, negligent, reckless, willful. There are all these different words that describe different levels of culpability. Uh, some are easier to prove than others. Um, what if you have a statutory offense that is silent about the state of mind? They sometimes exist. Uh, the courts will basically read in a knowing or a knowledge element, right? In other words, strict liability crimes where, where you know, you do it and you're guilty regardless of your mens rea, those are disfavored. But we have strict liability crimes, for example, statutory rape, right? Whether you know the person's underage or maybe a fake ID or mistaken, it doesn't matter. The act itself is a criminal offense. But if the statute's silent, the courts will read in a knowing standard. By the way, I think there's a decent argument that strict liability offenses violate due process. Uh, and there, there are challenges based on some statutory rape convictions that says mistake of fact should be a defense, right? Um, there are some state Supreme Courts that have hinted at that. They haven't gone quite that far, but I, uh, rant, um, slash rant, right? Um, but the court will generally read in a state of mind requirement to presume some basic level of mens rea. Uh, but let's say you have a statute that says, um, I don't know, driving more than 15 miles an hour is reckless driving. Could you say your defense, I didn't realize I was driving so fast, right? You have to impose a, no, you have to impose a knowing requirement. So the courts aren't going to do that. So generally this canon is not going to be applied to something like a driving speeding ticket. That would be a huge departure of law. Oh, this one's a biggie. We just had a Bivens decision yesterday, which you shall have read, Hernandez versus Mesa, right? Um, generally, Congress and most legislatures can create what are called causes of action. What does that mean? You can sue the government, right? Sovereign immunity is a general rule. You can't sue the government, but the government can create a cause of action that allows you to sue. Uh, perhaps the most famous cause of action is Section 1983, part of the original Ku Klux Klan Act, which allows you to sue um, state officials who violate certain constitutional rights. Uh, what about suing federal officials? Well, Congress never created any damage action to sue federal officials, so the Supreme Court made one up called the Bivens case. Um, and yesterday, the court didn't quite bury Bivens. They put the final nail in the coffin. Uh, it'll be like Jeremy Bentham will be on display, can't go anywhere. Uh, uh, and it's actually a decent analogy. Right, it's there. <laughs> it's rotting, filled with hay. You can't use it anywhere else. It's just gonna be in that one little box. And um, Justice Thomas would bury the entire damn thing with uh, Gorsuch, and that might yet happen soon enough. But implied causes of actions are disfavored. With an implied cause of action, it's not Congress creating it. Oops, sorry. It's not Congress creating it. It's the 
judiciary. All right? And the judiciary is asserting the right to create this cause of action. Uh, so this one said, the mere prohibition of a certain act does not imply the creation of a private right of action for its violation. The creation of such a right must be either expressed or clearly implied from the text of the statute. Uh, the 14th Amendment does not suggest a damage action as an implied cause of action, so I think the court was very hesitant to extend this. Um, if you want to read Scalia being pissed, just read this chapter. They talk about implied cause of action. Uh, he was ranting about this for many, many, many moons, and uh, we're now at the day where Justice Kennedy's on the court anymore, and the court just sort of, never mind. Um, uh, so anyway, the Her Hernandez versus Mesa decided, it was on Tuesday or, or Wednesday, of the, or Tuesday, uh, but it's a huge case for civil rights litigation. Okay, next. Moving along. Number 52 through 57. These are what Scalia and Garner call stabilizing canons. This is promoting stability in the law. Uh, 52. Uh, you may have heard a canon uh, statutes in derogation of the common law to be strictly construed. Have I heard that one? Scalia and Garner say it's not real, right? It, it's an old canon that courts applied because courts were hostile to statutory law, right? There was a time when all law was basically common law and you had a few statutes, and then the rise of statutory law. Uh, so Scalia said that's not the right approach. The better one is mere presumption against change in the common law. When you say, a statute will be construed to alter the common law only when the disposition is clear. So you generally follow the common law unless you try to change it. Um, there's no reason to give the, the, the common law the sort of godlike status. It was made up by judges for the most part. Uh, the legislature does have some uh, 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 role to play here as well. But you have to do it clearly. Okay, so nothing about strictly construing it. Uh, 53, the canon of imputed common law meaning. Um, if you have a statute that uses some common law term and it does not define it, you can say it adopts the common law meaning. Right? In other words, words undefined in a statute are to be interpreted according to their common law meaning. I'll give you a few examples. Assault child, defraud, estate, forge, fraud, next of kin, record of conviction, um, all federal statutes that use these terms, if they're not defined, you can go back to the common law, common law meaning. Okay? 50, whoops, 54 is a, a weird one called the prior construction canon. I'm a little nervous about this one. If a statute uses words or phrases that have received authoritative construction by the jurisdiction's highest court, or even uniform construction by inferior courts, they are to be understood according to that construction. Right? In other words, if there's some court decision that interprets a statute and then Congress enacts a statute using that same phrase, Congress is presumed to adopt the same meaning that the courts did. I don't like this one. Right? It's a separation of powers that bothers me. Uh, but you're allowed to make some Pretty cool? Okay, good. Okay. In other words, so there's an opinion from Chief Justice Vinson, who had a very short tenure in the court. He died of a heart attack uh, 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 shortly, uh, not only a couple years after he was appointed. I mean, that's why we got Earl Warren, right? We got Earl Warren because Fred Vinson died, and Eisenhower didn't want Warren to primary him, so he put him the Supreme Court. Yeah, who's laughing now? Um, you, you never know how things will shake out. But Chief Justice Vinson said, in adopting the language used in the earlier act, Congress must be considered to have adopted also the construction given by this court to such language and made it a part of that enactment. Okay? All right. So we presume that when a legislature acts, they are familiar with court decisions. Are they? Of course not. Uh, but that's what this canon discusses. Oh, we got a Thomas one. Finally, we got 55 slides in. All right. 
the presumption against implied repeal. Um, Congress can repeal statutes. They do so all the time. But what happens if they enact a statute that seems in tension with an earlier statute? Do we treat the prior statutes as having repealed? And this can, I think, is a good one. Repeal by implication or disfavored. Very much disfavored. I put that in quotes. It's an earlier enactment. So generally, we presume that courts are not going to repeal statutes unless they do so expressly. We don't like implicit repeal came up in a recent case I was involved with, the Affordable Care Act. Um, part of the statute, and they left other parts of it in place. And I argued early on, and the government agreed with me, that we don't allow implied repeals. In fact, I cited Garner and Scalia. And I think this is exactly right for that position. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. The repeal of a repealer canon, right? So this one's a little bit hard. Let me just, just, just Bear with me, this is a little hard to visualize, right? Congress enacts a statute. Congress enacts a repealing statute. Okay? At that point, the original statute's gone. Then Congress repeals the repealing statute. That doesn't resurrect the original statute, right? Once a statute's repealed, it doesn't come back to life, it does not reanimate, it's dead. Dead, dead, dead. It doesn't come back. Okay? Scalia calls it. I got a little tiny. A repeal of a repealer does not revivify the statutory corpse. I miss him. I do. I, mi I miss his writing. And reading this book made me sad. Like, wow, we're not getting a second edition of this book. It makes me sad. Um, but yeah, you can't bring it back. The common law, though, can't survive. So, in other words, you have a decision of a court, and that decision is overturned, and the overturned decision is overturned, you go back to the original one. So, go figure. Do it for the courts, but not for Congress. Oh, boy. I always said destitute, but Scalia said destitute. Des destitute, right? It's, it's like a W that should be where the U is, so destitute. I always I think I've been saying it wrong my entire life. Um, destitute, if I say that correctly, is the, ideal that, is the idea that there's some statute um, that's never enforced, and that a statute that's never enforced uh, loses its use. And, and Scalia says, no, 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 that's not right. A statute that is not repealed, I'm sorry, a statute is not repealed by non-use or destitute. Okay? Um, I think there are very good reasons for this canon. Excellent reasons, in fact, right? A statute, I think, has effect until Congress repeals it. It's really that simple. 10 years passes, 10, 20 years passes, 100 years passes. However many years passes, the statute still has effect. I mean, we have laws like, you know, the Alien Tort Statute, right, which is almost 230 years old. We're still litigating over it. It's a statute with, with effect. Um, how much time has to pass before destitute kicks in? And can the court even have the authority to do this? Um, now, there are some statutes that are just a uh, 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 facial, facial. So, you know, you have a statute on you know, fornication or perhaps so a ban on sodomy. Or you have a uh, statutes on it's effectively alienation of affection, right? Where you try to steal someone's you know, boy or girl, right? Uh, there's some statutes that are flatly inconsistent with modern law. Uh, the remedy there is just not to enforce them, right? There's, there's no need for a prosecutor to bring a, 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 a criminal prosecution. Um, and if there's a civil cause of action, I think the remedy is for the court to say, the statute's unconstitutional, right? We're going to join its enforcement. Um, but you can't just strike the statute of the book because it's old. And let me, let me mention a related point. Um, you should all read an article by Jonathan Mitchell called The Writ of Erasure Fallacy. That's people nodding. Um, I, I did it before and I hated myself for it. Do not say strike down laws. I did it and I hated myself. So I, don't say it, Josh. Courts do not, courts cannot strike down laws. They do not have the writ of erasure all courts can do is enjoin the enforcement of a statute between parties. That's all they can do. Don't buy into this strike down thing. And, and maybe your judge wants to say strike down. I'm not going to fight you over it, right? I, I always fight with my editors. And my colleague Randy likes strike down. I don't. So you see the next edition of our case book, you'll see some compromises. Um, they don't strike down laws, right? 
all court can say is this statute is going to enjoin it. Uh, I like declaring constitutional void. My God, they don't nullify. They definitely don't nullify, right? Because if there are decisions over resurrects, the statute comes back. We already said that, right? So the courts cannot like that. Um, there's a good example uh, uh, in, in the Mitchell article. Um, we all know um, uh, the civil rights cases, right? The civil rights case involved the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1870, which uh, prohibited uh, some forms of um, uh, segregation in places of public accommodation. And the court said, well, Congress can't ban local activity like a theater or so, so we're not going to talk about it. Did anyone know that the case books, but there are actually um, And one of these trains went from state A to state B. So wouldn't the movement of a train be interstate commerce? And the court says, well, the government didn't argue interstate commerce, so we're going to declare that unconstitutional, right? So they didn't even talk about whether they could ban it. Go to Plessy now. Plessy was a train, right? There's a decent argument that the Civil Rights Act of 1870 barred the state from enforcing a segregation ordinance. This was a state law. This wasn't private action. But why didn't the court in Plessy say that, this, that the um, the Louisiana law violated the Civil Rights Act of 1870. It was struck down by the civil rights cases. Plessy was wrong for a lot of reasons, but it was wrong because it was based on the myth of the river erasure fallacy. Right? I think the Plessy law violated the Civil Rights Act of 1870. They didn't even mention it. They said, oh, struck down, we have to talk about it. So this writ of erasure is not some sort of right-wing fantasy. Right? Uh, it's a basic principle that I think resulted in a massive constitutional error. Anyway, read John Mitchell's article. Uh, it's excellent. Uh, I think it was Virginia Law Review a couple of years ago. Very good. I was Virginia, I think. All right. This is not my notes, but I'm deviating. Um, next part. Uh, these are, I think Scalia had fun writing these. These were he calls falsities. Uh, myths, if you will. Irrepressible myths, if you're so encouraged, right? These are things that uh, these are things that your professors may have probably did tell you, um, and you now know better than to accept these 13 myths. Uh, the spirit of the law, right? It's our favorite, the spirit of the law. You probably read the case of the, the Church of the Holy Trinity, right? Uh, you think Baron Montesquieu, the, you know, not, oh, not Montesquieu, uh, the spirit of the law, uh, who wrote the Spirit of the Law? Just blanking. Uh, was it? No, no. It was on screen. Okay, I got it right. Okay, I, I, I blank. No, I'm thinking of um, Bastia. No, Bastia. The Law, yeah. But Bastia's the Law. Right, right, the Spirit of the Law. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long two hours. I'm almost there. All right. So this concept of the Spirit of the Law pervades in a lot of our discussion of the law. And Scalia and Garner write, there's this false notion that the spirit of the law should prevail over its letter. I'm going to butcher this name to anyone speak Italian? Okay. Cesare Beccaria? Am I in the ballpark? Okay. He was a great writer of criminal law and probably one of the most influential people on the framers in the area of criminal law. And he had this good quote, which I'm sure is translated, but translated well by Scalia and Garner. There is nothing more dangerous than the common axiom the spirit of the law is to be considered. To adopt it is to give way to the torrent of opinions. I think that's a, that's a wonderful quote. Um, no one has ever set forth any principle to understand what is the spirit that overcomes a letter. Right? Scalia and Garner write, it's a bald assertion of an unspecified and hence unbounded judicial power to ignore what the law says. And it leads to, quote, completely unforeseeable and unreasonable results. Now, the usual response that law professors give is, ah, but Chief Justice Marshall, right? Marshall would often refer to the spirit of the Constitution. But I want you to look at how Marshall used that opinion. He wrote in one case, the spirit of an instrument, especially a Constitution, is to be respected not less than its letter. Marshall wrote, the spirit is to be collected chiefly from its words, 
right? You get the spirit from his words. You get the purpose from his words. That's my gestalt for the last uh, two hours. Um, in another case, Marshall rebuked counsel who pressed his, quote, extravagantly absurd point, quote, with much ingenuity. He made an argument that was founded not in the words of the Constitution, but on its spirit. Marshall wrote, a spirit extracted not from the words of the instrument, but from his view of the nature of our union. Uh, Garner and Scalia write, today, however, the spirit of the law is the unhappy interpretive conception of a supposedly better policy that can be found in the words of an authoritative text. Now, my colleague Randy Barnett has an article on spirit of the Constitution, which I think is consistent with what Marshall wrote uh, uh, and consistent with Scalia. So I encourage you to as but you say, ah, the spirit of the law moves me, right? You know. Uh, okay. Number 59. Oh, this one. This one, I wish law clerks would have this stamped on their foreheads, right? The false notion that the quest to statutory interpretation is to do justice. There's a great quote from Charles Dickens that I always bring up. Um, Sometimes the law is an ass. Don't laugh, it's true. Sometimes the law leads to really sucky results that, 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 that are not good. Into the road. Uh, people have this desire to find answers that, 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 that are just. You quote a Kenny for this one, must have been ironic, right? Uh, our unwilling to soften the input of our Congress's chosen words, even if we believe the words led to harsh outcomes and longstanding. I wish he followed that in other cases. Um, courts do not have the license to do justice. In fact, the Supreme Court is a few blocks that way. Equal justice under law. I hate that expression, right? That's, that, that's not a phrase in any legal text. I, I, do, did Cass Gilbert make that up? Where did he get it from? Do you even know? I, I'll Google it later. I'll think on the plane. That's not a phrase in it. It said equal protection of the law. Okay, I can do that. But equal justice? No. Courts aren't in the business of dispensing justice. They follow whatever the law is, which is sometimes injustice. Courts can reach unjust results. And that's where the law leads it. They maybe change the law. So actually, I, you always have you know, the Supreme Court nominations. Equal justice in the law, that's not anywhere in our legal documents. That's not something that we have. Uh, uh, Benjamin Cardozo wrote a good quote. Uh, we do not pause to consider whether a statute differently conceived and framed would yield results more constant with fairness and reason. We take the statute as we find it. But then you have Learned Hand. Oh boy, you know what Learned Hand's real name was? First name? Billings. The guy went by Learned by choice. His Billings <laughs> Learned Hand. And his brother was Augustus, was his cousin. The brother of his cousin was Augustus, also a Second Circuit judge. Uh, so the, the expression was, you quote Learned, but you cite Gus, because the other judge was a little bit more normal, right? Um, so Learned, learned Hand said, the judge must conform his decision to what honest men would think right, and it is better for him to look into his own heart to find out what that is. Scalia writes, this was not a parody. Um, this is how many people think of law, and I fear how many law clerks think of law, uh, that their job is to do justice. If the law le leads to a just result, then that's it. If the law leads to, re to an unjust result, that's it. There's no overriding duty to justice. Now you have principle of equity, you balance hard courts consider factors, but your job is not to do justice when you read a statute. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not a job that, that courts have. Number 60. Okay. The false notion that when a situation is not quite covered by a statute, the court should reconstruct what the legislature would have done had it confronted the issue. Scalia writes, the question is not what Congress would have wanted, but what Congress enacted. Um, this doctrine comes up both in the severability context, and it works like this. You have this massive statute, and the court finds one provision unconstitutional. So the question becomes, what happens to the rest of the statute? Can you sever, that is, can you cut off the unconstitutional part, or must you throw the entire statute out? And I use a very gross analogy here, but it works. Right? So let's say you have gangrene. Right? Let's say you have a gangrene on your toe. OK? 
Can you just cut the toe off and live? Or maybe you have to cut the entire foot off? Or maybe you have to amputate below the knee? Or maybe the entire leg has to go? Or maybe the entire body politic must fall, you're going to die, right? How big is that constitutional infection, right? That might be one way of looking at it. But instead, courts say, what would Congress want? Would they want you to live with a toe or just a knee? You know, what, what would Congress have wanted you to live with? Scalia and Garner write, Congress didn't think about these issues. They had no idea. Some statutes have what are called severability clauses that say, if you strike this down, keep everything else in place. Courts ignore those routinely. They, they, they don't even matter, right? Um, Judge Easterbrook describes this approach as a telepathic time traveler standard, right? Where you say, how would the Congress have wanted to resolve this? What would they have done? What would Susan Collins have done? You know, these, these sorts of questions, which I think are not, <laughs> which are not very good. <laughs> Did I say that loud? Sorry, John. Uh, you know, Susan Collins, was our, was our, we had Kennedy, now we have Collins, right? Uh, as, our, as our keeper of, of, of the truth. Um, <laughs> Um, this approach is problematic. Uh, Judge Eastbrook writes, uh, it's impossible for a court, even one that knows each legislator's complete table of preferences to say what the whole body would have done with the proposal it did not consider, in fact. He adds, judicial predictions of how the legislature would have decided issues did not, in fact, decide are bound to be little more than wild guesses, which is why this is a myth. And I would be very happy if the court goes away of Justice Thomas and gets at the business of judicial reconstruction. Just get the business. It's not, it's not a competency that courts have and they shouldn't even try to exercise it. Number 61. Okay, they call this a half-truth. Should a judge say that the consequences of the decision provide the key to interpretation? Scalia's is half-true, you know, mostly right, you know, the only two Pinocchios maybe, right? Um, when once the meaning is plain, it is not the province of court to scan its wisdom of policy. Right? So often at these confirmation hearings, they have questions, right? Do you favor the defendant? Do you favor the corporation? Do you favor the big guy or the little guy? And I think uh, Gorsuch had a very good answer. It's like, I favor whoever the uh, uh, law, law favors. So yeah, the frozen trucker case, you know, there's such insane arguments. Um, will we help minorities? Will we help women? Uh, judges should not base decisions um, uh, on the identity of the litigants. Uh, they should not be pure consequentialists. They shouldn't ask good result or bad result. Um, I think those Scalia say it's half true um, because judges invariably consider these factors. They do creep in. Uh, so they call it a half truth. Uh, this is one that Scalia and Garner have a big bugaboo about. Um, you've probably all heard the expression strict construction or strict constructionist, these sorts of words. There was a time when that was a word that was often used. And Scalia and Garner consider it a pejorative, that it's not accurate. They have this good quote from Frankfurter, literalness may strangle meaning. Um, if strict construction is a judicial straitjacket, Scalia says, it's outmoded, right? You don't follow it. <clears throat> Instead, Scalia and Garner use what they call a fair meaning approach. A fair meaning approach, right? You're not limited solely to hyper-literal meaning. You have 60, almost 70 canons that you can use. But do not use the phrase strict Okay. 63, I'll admit, I have no knowledge about this one. Anyone does tax, kind of tax court? I don't know. But apparently there's a false notion that tax exemptions are strictly construed. I could not tell you anything about this one. Uh, okay, it's false. Uh, Scalia, <laughs> Scalia says that tax exemptions should not be strictly construed. Um, Courts ignore it. Okay, I'm not going to argue with it. All right. Um, 64, the half-truth that remedial statutes should be liberally construed. And this is a great quote from Mr. Bentham. Uh, As if other statutes would be expounded illiberally and unbeneficially. Um, 
What does that even mean, liberally construed? Why would you illiberally e construe other statutes? Uh, also, what exactly is a remedial statute? Um, does any statute that does not seek to remedy an unjust uh, a situation, all statutes are aimed at remedying problems of various sorts. Um, this also gives rise to a lot of purposivism, which allows a lot of deviation from text. Okay. Uh, this one comes up every now and then. Uh, it's the idea that if there's a jurisdictional statute that divests a court of jurisdiction, that that statute should be narrowly construed. That unless there's an express ouster of jurisdiction, um, this statute might be based on what you can call self-preservation, right? The idea that judges don't like to be kicked out of their own cases. Um, but that's not the case. Federal courts, at least, are courts of limited jurisdiction. They only have jurisdiction as given to them by the Congress. And where jurisdiction was previously conferred by statute, it can be eliminated by a later statute, even if by implication. Um, how might this occur? So Scalia gives a state court example. I'll give a federal one in a minute. But he says, in a jurisdiction in which state and county courts by statute have concurrent jurisdiction over certain cases, let us say that a new statute provided that for some cases, uh, uh, for some of those cases, the state courts shall have exclusive jurisdiction now this, the county courts were ousted. Okay, all fair good with county courts. What about federal courts? Uh, the federal courts are very, very hesitant of what we might call jurisdiction stripping. You probably say this in fed courts, where at various nods, at various points in American history, Congress has tried to remove uh, jurisdiction from the federal courts for certain areas. Slavery, abortion, you know, you can figure out any, any statute, you'll find an example, right, they've tried. Um, and in some cases, the court has said, yep, we are courts of limited jurisdiction. And other courts have said, well, no, 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 there are limitations by maybe due process on this. Now you can imagine if you're a litigant and you're litigating a case for a number of years and you get to a court and, they, and the Congress says, you know what, we don't want to litigate this anymore. Jurisdiction stripped retroactively, you're gone. Um, there's unfairness here, but I think as a general matter, Congress controls the jurisdiction of the courts. Um, Problems that take up with Congress, but it's not a popular answer. Okay. Next, but I have a lot of time for Q and A at the end. I promise. I mean, for you, you're brimming with questions, so start getting them together. Uh, the false notion that committee reports and floor speeches are worthwhile aids in statutory construction. Um, Justice Daniel, you probably never heard of him, he was in the court for some time, wrote, how often words introduced for the purpose of explanation are themselves a means for creating doubt or ambiguity? All right, this is Garner and Scalia's biggest hobby horse, which is the use of legislative history. Um, back in the day when Scalia was with us, you would get an opinion where it says, unanimous decision, except Justice Scalia doesn't join footnote 12, right? Or, or, or Justice Scalia joins everything but footnote seven. And you're like, oh, okay. That means one of the judges in the majority cited legislative history. And Scalia, as a matter of principle, would just dissent from that one sentence. And he would do this all the time. It, it became so commonplace, like, oh, there's Nino again, right? But he was making a point. He was trying to signal to the world that this is not a legitimate form of statutory interpretation. And it stuck. Right after a while, his colleagues would just put the history in a footnote so it would be easier for Scalia to descend from it. So we wouldn't have to, you know, I descend from this one sentence, right? Um, since he left, that sort of practice hasn't existed. Justice Gorsuch has joined opinions with legislative history, as has Justice Kavanaugh. Um, the court still sort of like nods to Nino and they say, for those who find legislative history useful, da 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 da. And then, of course, they find it useful. Right, but this was one of Scalia's biggest hobby horses. And he gives some history, which, which I had forgotten, but, but was in this book. The Supreme Court didn't cite legislative history until 1859, which is fairly late. And they didn't use it to determine the meaning of the law, but rather to reflect the facts and existence of the law was enacted. 
And they cite another decision from 1897 where the court says, there was a general acqui acquiescence in the doctrine that debates in Congress are not appropriate sources of information from which to discover the meaning of the language of a statute passed by that body. The Supreme Court's retreat from this principle, though, would happen in due time. Um, Scalia writes, a reliance on legislative history also assumes that the legislature even had a view on the matter at issue. This is pure fantasy. In the ordinary case, most legislatures could not possibly have focused on the narrow point for the court. The few who did undoubtedly had varying views. There is no reason to believe, in other words, that a single legislative intent ever existed. Congress is a they and not an it. Scalia then writes, ponder how curious it is that the most virulent critics of originalism are typically the same people who rummage through legislative history to figure out what the enactors intended. So this is her argument generally on legislative history. Uh, Scalia also had a constitutional argument. Um, in our separation of powers, we have bicameralism and presentment, right, where Congress passes a statute, the president signs it. That's all Congress can do. Chada tells us that. The history, the legislative history, is not voted on. It's not proved on. It's mostly drafted by lobbyists and staff members, and the members of Congress maybe never see it. Why should we give it authoritative weight? There's an old maxim that with legislative history is like going to a crowd and picking out the friends. Oh, I see you, I see you, okay. Then you pick the right answers. It's like your ladder of purposivism. If you look at a history long enough, you can find something you want. Um, alas, most judges don't follow Scalia. Uh, I, I think this, this, this Jeremiah of his may not get much of a reception in the court going forward, which is unfortunate. Next, 67, almost to the end actually. The false notion that the purpose of interpretation is to discover intent. All right. Again, the notion of a collective intent is a fiction. There are 535 members of Congress. They all have different ways of thinking about things. They all have different ideas. They have different ideologies, different uh, uh, motivations. You can't reduce them potential spam, go away. You can't reduce them to a single intent, right? Okay. 66. Oh, this one's good. Some people argue that the plain language of a statute is the best evidence of legislative intent. No, 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 that's not right, right? The text itself is the best meaning, is the best evidence of what the text means. Okay. All we agree upon is the words and that's it. The mere fact that people voted on the statute does not mean they agree on the text. All right, the last two are probably the longest chapters of the book and there for a reason. This is where Scalia goes off on his own, right? So far, it's all about statutes and common law, but here he goes off on two principles that are I think specific to constitutional interpretation, which is of course, 69 is originalism and preview 70 is living constitutionalism. And so I'll spend some time on these. Um, there was an old criticism by Max Radin, who was a Columbia professor. And he wrote, lawyers are necess necessarily historians. If they do not take this task seriously, they will not cease to be historians. They merely will be bad historians. A common criticism, um, of originalism um, is that lawyers are not historians and therefore they cannot study history. And this criticism usually takes a form of what's called law office history. That you have a couple law clerks sitting in an office cobbling together statutes um, and they're just going to make stuff up that reaches result at the end. Okay. Um, let me tell you something. I, I interact with a lot of PhD historians. Um, they're not better than you not better than you. They are subject to the same biases, the same motivated reasoning, the same limitations anyone else's, especially in motivated cases. I'll tell you a little story. Um, I've done a lot of work on the foreign emoluments clause, which people have never thought about before. And um, I have a somewhat unusual theory that myself and a colleague have that the Constitution uses special language. 
that the phrase in the Constitution, office under the United States, refers to appointed positions. Okay. The president's not appointed. One of the pieces of evidence we have was a document created by Alexander Hamilton. Congress said to Hamilton, give us a list of all the people holding offices under the United States, summarizing, and Hamilton gave them a list of appointed positions. He did not mention the president or the vice president members of Congress. And we put this document in our brief and we said this is evidence that Hamilton shared our understanding of office under the United States. Uh, we also mentioned that there's this other document published sometime later after Hamilton died probably that lists the president. It's a very similar document. So what happens? The PhDs, the legal historians, they say, aha, we're going to get Blackman. We're going to get him. We're going to get him. So they go to the National Archives and they pull up this other document. And there it is. Hamilton listed the president. And then they filed a pleading in court saying we basically misled the court. Hmm. Now these were historians at the top universities in the country calling little old Josh and my colleague Seth Tillman in Ireland frauds. Hmm. Well, we knew this was coming. We were ready for it. Uh, so what did we do? We had five <laughs> antiquarians. These are people who authenticate Hamilton's signatures at auctions. Verify that we were right. And verify the other document was printed maybe 30 years after Hamilton died, after Burr shot him to death. We don't even know who made it. It was some random Senate functionary who basically made a copy of the document, like a Scrivener's copy, and he had the president. I have reasons why it's not important now. And you know what happened? We filed a response to an amicus brief. You can't do that, but we did it anyway. We basically, we sought leave to respond to an amicus brief. We, we knew it would be denied. That didn't matter, right? Uh, you can seek leave to do anything, my friends, right? As long as you seek leave, you're not in trouble. It, it's true. We seemed to file a brief. We knew it was getting denied, whatever. But, but, but anyway, well, we, we thought it might be granted. We hoped it would be granted, but it was denied. We made our point. And after that, the historians withdrew their claim. They apologized publicly. In the New York Times, they apologized. So I'm telling you something. They have nothing on you in terms of objectivity. The historians are subject to the same legal biases and motivated reason anyone else's in the Second Amendment context, in the Foreign Emoluments Clause context, anything involving the current president, right? Don't think that they have objections. Now, this doesn't mean you can just wake up and be an, an, an originalist, right? There's a lot of work you have to do. Now, so a couple of people, Georgetown people here. How many of you are doing Randy Barnett's uh, Kalama boot camp? Okay, a couple of hands. Maybe you should do it maybe next year. My colleague Randy has a thing at Georgetown where he uh, uh, gives you this crash course on originalism. Right? You study corpus linguistics with Justice Lee. And J James, you're doing that again this summer? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> Justice Lee, at least, will be doing it this summer. I, yeah, well, I, I'm not invited. Look at that, right? Uh, Randy gets enough of me. Um, uh, you'll learn from historians. You'll learn from people who study these issues. There are areas where historians have an advantage, right? And there are areas where originals have an advantage, right? Um, we knew how to read legal documents, understand this was not something Hamilton would have written. He was a careful lawyer. He had very meticulous records. If you looked at this document, it was so obvious Hamilton didn't do it. But this is something that lawyers would have an advantage over. Anyway, so the point is, you don't need to be a historian to be an originalist, but you can't do it you know, slipshod either, right? There are people who say this stuff carefully and look at legal meaning, and they look at meaning of terms, and they can improve upon substance. And I think one of the crowning achievements is actually not the Heller case. Everyone always says Heller. But Justice Scalia would always say the same thing. What was your most important decision? It wasn't Heller. There was a case called Crawford against Washington, which you may not even remember that case. Crawford involved the Confrontation Clause of the Constitution. Okay? Uh, the Confrontation Clause, I'm summarizing, says you have the right to confront your accuser which would seem to mean you have the right to confront your accuser in court, actually like look at the person in the face. Uh, but for many years, the court had this test with Ohio v. Roberts, right? Uh, uh, that said, well, if the out of court testimony is reliable, you don't have to have the expert testify in court, right? So if some lab tech does a report and their evidence is reliable, you don't have to cross examine the lab tech. In hindsight, those lab techs are messy. We, we know this, right? They, there, there are some lab techs that made such egregious errors, uh, you know, CSI effect. It's, 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 it's smoke and mirrors in many cases. 
But Scalia led this lonely Jeremiah, but also with Thomas, saying, look, we have this Constitution provision that says you have the right to confront your accuser. That doesn't mean an out-of-court report. And he would write dissent after dissent after dissent. And eventually, was it 2003 or four, five, uh, off by a couple of years, was it weird? Three, yeah, I think that was the first thing I said, 2003. Scalia got a majority of the court. And it wasn't right-left, it was Scalia, the, the law and order conservative with liberal members of the court. And they actually breathed life into the confrontation clause. They looked at Sir Edward Raleigh, right, the famous trial who cannot confront his accusers. And they, they wrote, I think, a damn good original secession, right? In that case, no one argued with Scalia's history because it was something that progressives have, were happy with, right? It's, it's, now we get to Heller, right? And they have the Second Amendment case where there's this bitter divide between Scalia and Stevens. And I don't want, I don't need to redress, I don't need to address it here. Um, but the mere fact that a case involves history does not mean it's out of whack. Uh, my colleague uh, James earlier mentioned that Judge Tapar in a Sixth Circuit case asked for supplemental briefing on, uh, on, um, on corporal linguistics. Uh, that was actually one of my ideas. Uh, I published an article recently called Originalism and Sorry Decisis in the Lower Courts in the New York University Journal of Law and Liberty. Um, it's online, you can download it. Uh, but one of the suggestions I have for lower court judges <coughs> is to actually request originalist briefing. That if there's some constitutional question on which the parties didn't brief, which is to be expected, the court can ask for briefing. It could be a single order, or even a standing order of the court. Um, appoint amicus, right? Give argument time to an originalist law school clinic, my goodness. Give argument time to a law professor who actually has some expertise in the area. Um, originalists on the circuit courts can actually lift up the enterprise, right? If originalist circuit court and district court judges request briefing, it forces law firms to actually produce originalist briefing. And they can maybe do lousy briefs, but I think it's reasonable to say they want to do good briefs. And they might look favorably upon lawyers who had this sort of training and actually were uh, uh, steeped in these methodologies. And maybe if the lower court decisions have more originalism in them, my god. Maybe the Supreme Court will as well, right? It trickles up that maybe the Supreme Court can actually build upon this. So I, I encourage you, if you get a case in your chambers in which there's some constitutional issue, and maybe it's one in which the Supreme Court has not opined, some novel issue, uh, I think there's nothing wrong with seeking out briefing on the question. I wish more judges would do it. I think, I, I think the Corpus Linguistics Order in the Sixth Circuit was a good model, and I, I cite it in my paper. Right, so the mere fact that lawyers on historians doesn't, doesn't end the issue. Right, there are different sources and different ways that judges can help improve upon this matter. Okay? But again, I can't stress this enough. You can't do a lousy job. Um, a lousy original's opinion is worse than no original's at all because it creates an easy target. Say, ah, Judge X did a crappy job, that means original is wrong. No, it just means Judge X did a crappy job. So if you're going to do it, you got to do it right, and you got to do it careful. And that means not making it up by yourself. Have adversarial briefing on the issue. If you do that, you'll be in a much better position than if you just try and go it alone. Right? You can't just whip up Kofia and say, aha, I'm an expert in corpus from good six. Good luck with that. People have spent their years thinking about this, and there's still a rich and vigorous debate on how to do it right. Debates are good, but you have to have the methodology. Okay. Oh my goodness, I think it's the last one. All right. Um, then we'll get to Q&A. Um, the last one from Justice Scalia was about living constitutionalism. And this is a phrase that I think ebbs and flows. Um, I don't think any nominee goes to a hearing and says, you know what, I'm a living constitutionalist. They all say, oh, I follow text and history except when I don't, right? But they, 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 no one actually says, in this country at least, in other countries they, they do use this terminology, but in this country at least they don't say living constitutionalism. Um, Thomas Cooley wrote 1868, the meaning of the Constitution is fixed when it was adopted and is not different at any subsequent time when a court is occasion to pass on it. Um, we have an old Constitution. It's 250 years old. Okay. And people will say, well, wait a minute, the framers would not have wanted our Constitution to last 250 years. I don't think so. 
Magna Carta was 1215. At that point, it was nearly 500 years old. Right? The lawyers were framers. And they knew very, very well that uh, uh, disputes would arise based on framing. They understood these ideas. Now, one of the most common responses, ah, but what about Chief Justice Marshall? You see, he's a cause of everything, all of our difficulties, right? McCulloch v. Maryland, Marshall wrote, we must never forget that it is a constitution we are expanding. Um, and this is a phrase that's used say, aha, we can, just constitution, you know, no big deal, right? But I don't think that's what he was suggesting. I think he actually had the opposite suggestion. Marshall said this to justify his holding that the word necessary in the necessary and proper clause should not be construed to exclude the choice of means and leave to Congress in each case with only, uh, that only which is most direct and simple. Why? Because this provision is made in a constitution intended to endure for ages and to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. Right? He was talking about the specific context of the necessary and proper clause, that what might be necessary and proper will depend upon the exigencies of the day. But Congress delegated that power to Congress to make a decision. Right? There's no need to read necessary and proper evolving because it will be based on contextual ideas. In other cases, Marshall said the Constitution was intended to be perpetual, a word that actually doesn't appear in the Constitution, uh, but was in the Articles of Confederation. Uh, so I, I don't need to dunk on living constitutionalism. I think you get the idea. Um, uh, uh, no one actually advocates for this publicly if they're a judge. Professors do. I would think this idea has mostly fallen into destitute, if I may. The end. Thank you all so much. And if you haven't, buy my book uh, with Randy Barnett. I think you're waiting for it, weren't you? 100 Supreme Court cases everyone should know. Uh, it should be on every bookshelf in every, uh, every lawyer's office in the country. All right, not, not really the end. All right, I left a lot of time for Q&A, and also we can get to reception afterwards. So questions. And it can be a question on what I've covered here or a question on clerkships in general, things in your mind. James, patiently waiting for the last 90 minutes. Oh boy, yeah, there's a lot in that question. Um, so the first part, uh, I, I think I know the Kethledge article you mentioned. Um, Judge Kavanaugh had a similar article uh, when he was in the DC Circuit, where he said that his colleagues were far too quick to find a statute ambiguous, which then goes to Chevron deference, right? So, so you need to do hard work to actually get to ambiguity. There, there, there's, a, there's a step. But I think uh, James's other question is a profound one. Um, how do you avoid motivated reasoning? And if you don't know what that concept is, we all have intuitions. We all um, inadvertently lean in certain directions. Like if I just told you a fact, right? If I showed you a, 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 a picture of protesters and I told you that they were protesting X, you would think one thing. Say they're protesting Y, you think another thing, right? We automatically lean in directions. So when you get a case you know, on your docket that comes through, before you even realize that you've already made up your mind and it's invariably true, um, so one um, gut check that I often tell my students, and I try myself, is I ask myself, um, <clears throat> does my reasoning match up with my preferred preferences? That if, let's say it's a case about an issue that I care deeply about. Uh, 
do I reach the same result under both my policy preferences and under my legal reasoning? And if the answer is yes, I have to go back really hard and scrub my approach. Um, I'll give you an easy example, right, uh, with, with immigration. I, I filed a brief on behalf of the Cato Institute this year in the DACA case. And the brief basically says, a brief in support of DACA as a policy, but against as a matter of law. We got kind of cute with the title, but it was accurate, right? We, we think DACA is a good policy, but it's illegal. And I can say this, look, I, I don't agree with myself. I'm internally conflicted. Um, if all of your decisions always cut in the same direction, then you're probably maybe going with motivated reasoning. Scalia would often hold an example out um, involving flag burning, right? Uh, in Texas versus Johnson, case of flag burning, could a person be prosecuted? Scalia cast the fifth vote to uphold, I'm sorry, to, to declare the statute unconstitutional. And Scalia had this great story. Uh, it, it, he told this many times. He said the next morning he was having breakfast with his wife Maureen, uh, and she was reading the Washington Post, and the front page said, Scalia votes to, uh, Scalia votes for the flag burner. And apparently she starts humming the national anthem. <laughs> and he says, I've had enough, I'm going to work. And he storms out. Uh, maybe, maybe a made-up story, we don't know, but it's a good one. But Scalia would often hold this example as a way where his policy preference did not line up with his legal views. And he's, I'm paraphrasing, he said, if I had it my way, I would throw every scruffy, scruffy-haired beard, no, every scruffy-haired weirdo in jail who burned the flag, but I'm not a dictator, so I can't. Um, so that's one way to check it, um, but you have, to, you have to be honest to yourself, you have to be true to yourself. There's no there's no way around it, and I think um, you're all going to be law clerks giving humility to your judge every now and then and <coughs> expressing a contrary point. Now, you don't get to disagree with them. They go one way, you go with them, right? You can't write a dissent to them. Or maybe you can put it in your diary, but you're... <laughs> you can! I, I, I had a couple opinions that didn't get accepted. It's like, all right, well, that, that's what I think, and I made them into articles later in life. Um, uh, but you're stuck with that. Any questions? Yes, what, just say your name, please. Uh, Alex Dahlgren. So, I, my question is about legislative history and the cast of her, like, her few versions of the statute. Uh -huh. Is it digging into legislative history to look at perhaps a prior version of a statute where part of it was repealed yeah. and to interpret the part that's remaining? Yeah, there was one slide, and I'm going to try and find it now, uh, that discusses statutory history. Right, the history of a statute. I think that's legitimate. Um, it, it, if statute A was enacted and Congress made a change to statute B in relation to it, those are all acts of the legislature and those are entirely legitimate to check. I, indeed, revised statutes make it complex, but you're allowed to think do that. There's no, no, no objection there. Yes? Yeah, I, I saw someone actually has the book. Why don't I just hold it up? It's a huge book. I just summarized a lot in three hours. You can spend a, you can spend a, an entire semester on that book. Uh, but they they're pretty neutral. The, in some places, they 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 sort of pull back the curtain, and give their opinions, but they try very hard to give normative justifications. And they also give the exceptions for when these various canons ought not to apply. Um, I think where this book will be useful is you'll often have lawyers use canons in their briefs completely incorrectly. Right? I just mispronounce them. I think I at least understand them because I hope so, right? But lawyers will just completely botch canons and they'll be stuck with a text like, oh crap, associate, do something. I don't know. Use it, go go check a canon, and you can say, no, that's not how we use it. And that's one useful place. Like this is not a correct way to use these various principles. Yes, yeah, so just what's your name? Uh, Jack. Jack. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Scalia and Garner kind of hint at this in the Llewellyn discussion, right? Not, they don't mean that one, you know, intermediate court in Idaho said this. Right? That's that's not going to be a can. No, no disrespect to the clerk. An intermediate court in Idaho. I have no disrespect, but. Um, it has to be something that's so well understood it's part of English, right? It's part of the way we read legal texts. It's deeply I embedded. Um, and I think if you, if you read the history of this book, they went through thousands of possible canons, and they narrowed it down to about 60 or 70 of them. And, and that was done by uh, 
the sheer volume with which they're used in different documents. Yes, what's your name? Bonnie. Bonnie. I think it's helpful because at least makes your reasoning transparent, right? And, and I'm not joking. Cite the Scalia book. Just cite Section 42, right? Because then that 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 tells your reader that there's a body of knowledge that you're incorporating. Um, the reason why this book is so good is often courts do not state their reasoning, right? They they apply a mode of reasoning and they don't tell you what they're doing. And what Scalia and Garner did was they said, "Aha! We know what you're doing. You're using this canon. You didn't say you're using this canon, or maybe use a slightly different nomenclature for it." Right? Using these labels helps to reaffirm that it's real. It's not just made up, they can resolve concrete cases. And when judges use it, then parties start using it also. That's my supply side uh, argument. I think, I think judges who embrace these principles, and they, they should, will send signals for litigants that you have to do it also. Good question. Thank you. Another question. And it's been a long day. My voice is going. Thank you so much.